Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through, right here, wherever you are on this beautiful or cold. Something's going on here on Tuesday, the new release day for the drive Through. I am your host, the great Brian Last, and of course, the man who is the star of the drive Through, who'll be answering your questions and reviewing the Elimination Chamber, and probably upsetting a person or two, Mr. Jim Cornette. We're having a heat wave, a tropical heat wave. We're having a heat wave. It's so hot, Brian. It's been above freezing here in Louisville, Kentucky for 24 hours now. All the big four-foot-long ice daggers hanging off the turrets of Castle Cornette have come down. The driveway is washed off. We can see the ground again. It's, it's a miracle. It's a heat wave. How's the weather up there where you live? We have a snowstorm active as I record right now. <laughs> well, it sucks to be you, doesn't it, Last? I like the snow. You need to move to Last Manor South. No. Wait, why don't you turn Mar-a-Lago into Mar-a-Lasto? I hope I never end up living in Florida. What a dump. Oh, I thought you were going to say, I hope I never wind up living in Mar-a-Lago. What a dump. Well, it's part of Florida. So. Now, there's nice places in Florida. Yeah, Florida's great for a week and a half, two weeks. And then after that, enough. Enough of the humidity, enough of the rain, enough of the palmetto bugs, enough of everything. Enough of the bad drivers. You know, there's a lot of people down in the, in the state of Florida that could say the same thing about New York City, your beloved New York City. Oh, I have a solution. I have a solution for that. Stay in Florida. <laughs> because let me tell you something, living in the Northeast, growing up on Long Island, now living in the beautiful suburbs of New Jersey. Where the polo ponies roam free. The worst thing in the world is being on the road in late spring and summer and seeing those Florida license plates. Those people who spent half the year in Florida, or one day more than half the year, for tax purposes, in Florida, and then they come back up to New York, and they're on the road, and they're driving like garbage. Stay in Florida. That's Wait what a minute, I how does garbage drive? Really, really slow and stinky. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that everybody that drives faster than you is a maniac, and everybody that drives slower than you is an idiot? Not too many people drive faster than me, so maybe, maybe I'm the maniac. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> well, and, uh, I've heard that as well. So you've just completely alienated... Our southern audience, with your comment. Not necessarily, because I have a lot of friends in Florida, and almost every one of them says, I can't wait to get out of the state. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't have anything against people from Florida. I feel like everybody ought to own one or two of them. Anyway, what do we do on this program here? We answer questions that the listeners send in, and of course, this is a special edition, a review of another WWE pay-per-view event, and... It happened. It, yeah, well, it did, and we'll, we'll get to it in due time. I want to bring up some... Oh, and by the way, I should mention, let's get this out of the way, the commercialism out of the way, because people have been demanding, no, we revealed it on the experience this past week. The action figures, the official Jim Cornette action figures from Figures Toy Company will be back in stock, and the store, the Cornette's collectible store at jimcornette.com will be reopened. On Sunday, March the 14th, to the triumphant sound of the bugles and the hallelujah. I can't, I can't hit that note anymore. We're going to have the original red and yellow version of the action figure. Uh, first time in a year and a half, it'll be on sale. And the red and green Christmas variant that broke the internet last year and sold out in two hours. And this will be the last run of both of those. I've been assured by Figures Toy we've got up to 1,500 of each of these available this year in calendar 2021. So they'll last a little longer than two hours, I hope. Uh, but this will be the last run of both these designs before we pull a wild card, bitches. That's, that's to come in at least 2022. But anyway, Sunday, March the 14th, Cornette's Collectibles reopens at jimcornette.com. The action figures go on sale. And uh, and I will crack up probably 10 to 14 days after that mentally and be put in a home. But I've also talked to Hotchkiss Featherbottom, and I've been assured that we're doubling back with the folks at Cameo this week. Now that this 
fucking NASA communications device. I paid more for this phone than I did my first car. Uh, and, and we're going to see about announcing a date on the cameos next week uh, on the experience. We're, we're, we're trying to work that out now. But th this could be an interesting experiment, a social experiment, Brian. Who's, are they going to want me to talk nice to them, or are they going to want me to talk bad to other people? That's, I'm wondering what the predominant prevailing winds will be on the cameo selections when we do offer these for sale. Well, obviously, there'll be options. You could give a birthday greeting. You could answer someone's question. You can cut a promo on them, cut a promo on someone else. The, yeah. the, it's literally limitless. Only your imagination and 250 characters that you get to jot down the, <laughs> Is that all you get? the general tone of the thing. Well, that's what you, it's like a tweet. You know, you get to, hey, this is Joe, and I want to tell John that he fucked my wife and I'm pissed at him or something like that. But no, you're going to have to give me things to work with, people. I need some background. I can't. Here's the thing. Just don't say insult so-and-so. Because, they, well, how do I? Is he fat? Is he skinny? Is he stupid? Is he ugly? <laughs> or, you know, I mean, give me is something to go on. <laughs> yes, he's stupid. What are you, stupid? <laughs> if you want me to insult your, your ex-girlfriend... Well, you got to give me, you know, something to work with. If she is she beautiful but stupid, I can't say, hey, they put her picture in prison to cure sex offenders if she's a knockout. But meanwhile, she's got a brain the size of a dehydrated BB. You see, I almost think it's funny if you just say, I hear you're beautiful, but stupid. But stupid. <laughs> you're stupid. You're a stupid, stupid person. Hmm. You should just talk like Mo Howard the whole time. <laughs> I hear you're a moron, you idiot. What do you mean? I'm sorry, Mo. I didn't mean it, Mo. I won't do it again, Mo. What more can I say, Mo? Whatever you want. We'll we'll try to fulfill those requests. We'll have news on that next week. I've started a mini Twitter controversy, and not really a big deal. I didn't actually insult anyone. It's just that all the amateur mixed martial arts experts and the you know the knowledgeable historians out there on Twitter have weighed in again on who could kick whose ass and the fact that modern fighting techniques have just evolved so well that apparently Matt Riddle's now one of the world's most dangerous men in in the eyes of some of these people. Did you hear about this? I saw you retweet an article about him saying that. The wrestlers today, I believe, weren't soft, but are actually more intelligent than the wrestlers of years past. Well, yes, and and we're gonna. It was, he was responding to Undertaker's soft comment, which everybody. We're gonna weigh in on that in a minute, folks. Spoiler alert! But let me digress for a second. We'll come back to it because then Riddle made everybody else's point, trying to make his own. Is what he did, but what he was saying was, "Oh, bro." We're not soft. We're smarter than they were back in those days. We don't bring guns to work because they have like metal detectors now, man. I swear to God, he said, we have metal detectors now. You fucking vapid twit. That's not the point that he was trying to make. So I'll try to flesh out uh, what I believe to be Taker's point in a minute. But I had responded on Twitter just that this guy is always doing something to run his fucking yap. And... Remember, he's the one that is trying to shoot his own angles to work with Brock Lesnar, where Brock had to get in his face and say, you and I will never work together, flat out to him. And he wants to, he doesn't understand how this business works, because apparently what we see on screen is not that much of a gimmick. He has an understanding the depth of a snake's belly in a wagon rut about what this business is or has been in the past. But I'd mentioned just his overall disrespectful to, to everybody, whether it's knocking the guys the past, I, we're smarter than they are, or athletes are better now, or the business is better because of this or that, or whether he's one of the performance entertainment guys, even if he's got the UFC background so he can pull the performance card if he wants to and still look like a badass. The point is, I just said, I would have loved to have seen this, this yap running in in the locker rooms with anybody from Hodge to Dr. Death around to shove his head up his ass when that would have been tolerated, basically as a basis of my tweet. 
And missing the point of the whole thing, everybody then st- it started an argument as to whether Matt Riddle could kick the shit out of Dr. Death. And I'm like, fuck. And that's why I say all the amateur MMA experts came out of the woodwork. And, the, well, the fighting techniques have really improved over the years. One of the knuckleheads I saw on Twitter even said, well, no, Riddle could beat Hodge. I'd like to say here right now at the outset of this program, that if there is within the sound of my voice any current or former high-level mixed martial artist, amateur wrestler, expert, trainer, or coach in same, or valid historian with a learned opinion that anybody gives a shit about, that wants to plead the case that Danny Hodge could not in any form of combat have fucking humbled Matt Riddle I will give you the opportunity to come on the program here and and plead that that argument. And I don't think we'll have any fucking takers. But as far as, again, because poor Doc, he's going to be forever remembered as the 40-year-old guy with a torn hamstring that got knocked out in an amateur boxing match. And it wasn't limited to there. I was limited to 240 characters. You could have mentioned at any given point in a number of eras, Bill Miller, Carl Gotch, Billy Robinson, Haku. And a lot of these fucking supposed experts of today will think because they've seen pictures of these guys when they were fat and 60, that there's no way that they could have beaten Matt Riddle because he was in the UFC. Brian, I, I ask you, well, first of all, Yes, I understand Matt Riddle could whip Dr. Death today because Doc's dead. And he probably could have whipped Dr. Death right before Doc died when he was fucking 50 or whatever. But if you followed the train of thought of my tweet and you put Matt Riddle in the locker rooms of a territory in any era when the business was still respected and people took up for it amongst the boys, amongst themselves, if he walked back in the locker room after saying some shit like he says, then, I, Brian, I asked you, if both Matt Riddle, how, how old is he today? See, what is he, 28, 30 maybe? I'll look that up right now. Look it up right now. Because it, let's say he's 28 years old. 28-year-old Matt Riddle walks into the locker room with 28-year-old Dr. Death Steve Williams. 35. He's 35. All right, well, he's... He's a youthful looking fellow. All right. I don't remember what, whether uh, fucking doc was broke down or not by the time he was 35, but let's say they were both 30. Let's just split the difference. Cause I knew doc best when he was in his mid to late twenties. They're both 30 years old. Matt Riddle walks in a locker room after running his mouth, disrespecting wrestling, calling it a fucking show, saying he's smarter than all the fucking guys, whatever the fuck. And Dr. Death is pissed at Matt Riddle. Matt Riddle is what? Is he 200 pounds? Did he fight at 190 in the UFC? Dr. Death is 290 to 310, depending on just depending Dr. Death is a four time all American fucking collegiate wrestler at a major university and fucking was dominant at that as well as a four time all American football player. And he's also probably coked up at this point. Dr. Death does not walk up to Matt Riddle and say, Mr. Riddle, I have a problem with what you've said. And therefore I would like to challenge you to a grappling contest on the mat with Pee Wee Anderson here serving as referee, and one of us will eventually tap out. I don't think he would do that. I think Dr. Death would do what I've seen him do before, thankfully not to me, but to people with whom he was not pleased with, and go, Motherfucker, I'll rip your fucking throat out! Followed by getting that wild-eyed expression and smothering fucking Matt Riddle with goddamn his 300 pounds, bashing his fucking brains out, going for his goddamn eyes, and if Matt Riddle tried to get uh, a jujitsu move on him in that environment, there's chairs, there's benches, there's lockers, there's bottles, there's bags. And I wouldn't imagine that Doc would have a problem with picking one up and bashing fucking Matt Riddle over the fucking head with it. Now you can substitute 
the style of confrontation, if it had been Danny Hodge, Danny Hodge might very well have said, Mr. Riddle, I've got a problem. I can't do Hodge's voice with what you just said about our business, and I'm going to teach you some respect. And then he would have taken Matt Riddle down and stretched him right there, whether it was a mat or a ring or whatever, because it was Danny fucking Hodge. Or if it was Haku, maybe he would have just bit the guy's face off without talking to him at all. Or if it was Bill Miller in 1956, he would have been six feet six and 280 pounds and an NCAA heavyweight champion, and he would have stretched Matt Riddle. Or what? why is it that just because this guy was a low-level UFC fighter that the modern fans don't understand that just because wrestling is a work does not mean that anybody that was in it that has ever populated the locker rooms couldn't kick the shit out of Matt Riddle for real. Well, I think one of the important things, too, is what you referenced before talking about Brawl for All. The UFC, there are rules. In a fight, in a locker room, or wherever else, there are no rules. It's a fight. Yeah, well, there were rules in a brawl for all. They were just stupid rules. That's what I'm saying. I yeah. mean, Dr. Death was for already 40 years old, and he was wearing gloves, and there were rules. It wasn't like, go fight Billy Gunn in an alley. It's, go fight him under these rules. <laughs> so there's a difference between a UFC fight, a fight with rules, and an actual fight. A real fight. But they have, they have to slag poor Doc off, because he got knocked out in a fucking bad tough man contest but that's it's just the fact of the matter is this is what i meant by touching on what undertaker said and i guess people just can't perceive it unless they've seen it either the fans of that time period from the outside or me from the inside wrestling what pro wrestling truly is is miles away from what today's product is. And when Undertaker said the product is soft or the guys are soft, that doesn't mean that, my God, they could have George St. Pierre could be sitting in the locker room drinking milk and playing video games and going out and being polite on and saying, I'm, I'm so happy to be here in the WWE, and he would come off soft. The baddest fighter, real fighter in the world, it's Vince McMahon's favorite saying that he said more times than anything else, including pal, perception is reality. The reason why that pro wrestling has plunged in popularity is because the perception that people have of it now. Pro wrestling is a conflict with an aura of menace and violence with physicality and and you have heels that either project an aura of menace if they're monsters or if they're the chicken shit heels they project an aura of danger because they're such morally bankrupt people that will have to cheat and lie and steal they'll do anything and they put the baby faces your heroes in jeopardy of being cheated or being stolen from or being even injured, fucked up, and can't wrestle anymore. Oh, my God. And they have personal issues. And the way that this gets over is the aura that the talent casts off. Even if you know it's a work, subliminally, this guy or that guy, for whatever reason, how many times do you hear this story being told? So-and-so scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. They, it, it, you get enough of those people together along with a group of likable, heroic types that, yes, when their backs are against the wall, they fight back and they overcome obstacles, but they, they have to be put upon first. You have to root for the underdog and they have to try to be honorable. And then finally, they go too far only to get even, blah, blah. It's a morality play. And the, the subliminal aura that these guys give off is more important than who they are. That's why they invented gimmicks in wrestling. The people that can portray those gimmicks are ones that have a, a, a great deal of validity to them to begin with, and they turn it up, as we've mentioned many times before. But part of the reason that those guys in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, not even talking about the 40s and the 30s, 
when these guys would probably fucking kill you as soon as look at you. But even when the business got more civilized, it was still a, an independent contractor's game, truly. And you still had to take care of your public image as a wrestler and not do stupid things that made you look weak or do jobs to people that you were a, above in the pecking order, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes when people took liberties, the booker was a wrestler himself. He'd say, if you got a problem with so-and-so, go fucking sort it out. He might try to intervene if it was going to fuck up his business, but it was probably going to fuck up his business if they didn't sort it out anyway. So he'd goddamn let him do it. And if, if Watts was notorious for that in his territory, but all those old timers were. But the idea, just Undertaker wasn't glorifying it. Everybody should come in a locker room with a gun in their bag. But at the same time, it was the aura and the impression that those guys gave off to the fans and to some of the other boys that they would take care of themselves if they needed to, that made them dangerous and gave them an aura of menace that the fans bought into. And we, we've told a story here on a program. We've read the newspaper article, Brian, remember in the, one of the in news segments, maybe on your show, whatever, where Johnny Valentine got arrested for what was the charge public drunkenness at the gardens here in Louisville one night in the sixties after a match with who was it? Gene Kaniski. <clears throat> but that's when Bobby Heenan was there. He had always told the story that the first night he came to Louisville, Johnny Valentine got in a fucking fight in a locker room with wee Willie Davis, who was a retired wrestler, but he was a sheriff's deputy here in Louisville at the time. And Valentine had caused a fucking stir. Wee Willie Davis goes in to goddamn arrest him valentine's reaching in his bag and wee willie davis starts whacking him with a fucking slapjack that was the locker room atmosphere in a lot of a lot of places but that transferred over to the fans believing in what they in the people they saw even if they couldn't really believe what they saw bill dundee had a great line in, in memphis heat the documentary he said hell the people believed it because we believed it that was a, a different aura and a different atmosphere, which now they've been so homogenized and pasteurized and sanitized for your convenience and the modern corporate atmosphere of the publicly traded companies and the blah, blah, blah. And the fact that a lot of these guys, whether they are real athletes, real fighters or not, come into this with the mindset that they're actors and entertainers. The whole thing comes off soft, not gritty and grainy, but fucking choreographed. It's gone from a conflict with an aura of menace and violence to an athletic stunt show with an aura of choreography. And I think that, with possibly not being quite as articulate as I am, is what Undertaker was trying to say when he said it's soft, because it looks soft, because these are not out of control. Wild West type, larger than life personalities that you can buy into for even one second will go into business for themselves and just do what the fuck they want because they can. And that's the way you get a star in wrestling over. That's what we've lost because there is not one fan now watching any promotion, even the ones that do it kind of gritty and realistic they're suffering because of the mainstream presentation and the overwhelming perception which is reality that wrestling is a fucking gymnastics cheerleading exhibition these days but when you have that prevailing opinion amongst the masses you're, it, it's it's soft it's it's a show even if it was a show for all those other decades, it was a show with guys that were enough on the fringe of polite society in some cases that you could get into it and they were allowed to go and do what they did. And just the, the fucking spontaneity and the, the emotion has been whipped out of this thing by the writers and, and, or the, publicly traded companies and major television networks and or cosplay marks that have been allowed to populate the the fringes and now that the fringes are becoming mainstream because the 
regular fans have pretty much given up on anybody that they don't think that they can whip being a star on television anymore. What do you think, Brian? I don't know. Don't tell me that wrestlers today are smarter than any of the wrestlers of the past when you are currently in trouble for allegedly sexually assaulting your mistress. That's what I think. Oh, I just got that. We were we were back to we were back to the Riddler. I just yeah. got it. I mean, just the, the whole. I yeah. couldn't get past that whole thing that wrestlers today are so much smarter than wrestlers yeah. of the past. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, we just back in those days, back in the eighties, we we. Played cards in a locker room, told fucking stories, practiced holds, went out and had matches and sold tickets. Now they have all kinds of better habits. Anyway, what do you got? Oh, is it my show again? It's your show again. Have you heard about the Joshi Apartment Wrestling? I guess it's not my show again. And no, I, I don't know what you're... I remember Apartment House Wrestling... Shot by Theo Errett in what, yes. Sports Review Wrestling magazine. Well, and it infiltrated over into a number of the magazines. And folks, for those of you who don't know that there's a precedent for what we're about to talk about, in the 1970s, Stanley Weston, who was still the publisher of, of London Publishing, but he was, I guess he was an old, a dirty old prevert. And poor old Bill Apter, who was the editor and the, the main honcho and had to take all the heat, had to create a thing called apartment house wrestling so that they would have an excuse to put pictures of girls wrestling in front of a curtain and bikinis on their magazine wrestling magazine cover. Cause Stanley West is who sells magazines. And I don't think poor, wonderful Willie after has lived it down to this day. And the photos, as you mentioned, <laughs> were by noted wrestling photographer, Theo Errett from Los Angeles, because you could get a lot of models that wanted to fucking wrestle each other in bikinis out in Los Angeles. Some porn and stars too. in some of those photos there. you, Yeah, there was, it was, it was a, a big paying deal there. Um, and, and the wrestling promoters hated it because it was obviously phony and the wrestling fans, except for the people who, and I don't even know why it would have sold magazines. I think only in Stanley Weston's mind, because, there wasn't that much price difference between that and Playboy, and they were still fucking in bikinis, right? Or with a bar over their their tender bits. They were in bikinis usually, yeah. There, there was some in the early days. He got the black bar over there, you know. But regardless, you could buy Playboy right next to it on the newsstand. So I don't think it sold any wrestling magazines. So the fans didn't like it. The promoters didn't like it. And it was obviously phony. So it's been revived. I can't believe you didn't see this. Somebody tweeted me this. And I saw it's it's apparently they did like a fucking hour or two hour show out of this. But from the fine folks who have brought you the Japanese division of the AEW women's tournament, they actually are doing Joshi apartment house wrestling for YouTube in Japan. And apparently the the genius behind this is old uh, Emmy Sakura, who was the oh, Freddie on. Mercury cosplayer. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not making this up. I've seen the video. They tweeted it. Um, Emmy Sakura, who dressed up as Freddie Mercury, complete with the mic stand and mustache, is apparently behind this. I read just a little of the the dribble behind it. And it's a it's a bunch of those same women, and they come in. It, it's an apartment somewhere in Japan, just a room. There's no ring. They have some type of padded material on the floor, and they come in from a curtain hanging over a doorway, and they have their matches in in the room in the apartment. And these are the same world class athletes that are being spotlighted in the AEW Japanese division of the women's tournament. Now, do you think I'm, I'm already dreading what you'll say here? But <laughs> let me ask you a serious question. Serious question. I assume the audience for apartment house wrestling in the old magazines were perverts. We're just weirdo wrestling perverts. I doubt anyone was saying, oh, my God, I wonder if Bunny will win this match yes, this week. Yes, Oh, and the storylines they'd concoct where the rich <laughs> millionaire had put $100,000 on little orphan Fanny to fucking come out on top. I Okay, go ahead. 
Is it the same audience for this? Is it like the same weirdo pervert wrestling audience for Joshi apartment house wrestling? I can't believe that this is a real thing. Well, it, that's not, I don't know what the official title of this thing is. And if I did, honestly, I wouldn't give it out because then they'd get like a hundred thousand YouTube views of people trying to determine whether this is a real thing or not, but it's a real thing. I, I, I am not going to go out on a limb and start trying to analyze or Freudize all the various Japanese fixations and fetishes and habits and picadillos and things that we seem to hear about more and more on a constant basis. Otherwise, and now I understand apparently why Olivier spent so much time there and, and what he came away with, but they're, they're all again, they're dressed as, as genies and, School girls, or I think one girl had the kind of a maid thing on, but then it like Riho was last week on TV with you know lace doilies around their wrists to make those punches look really violent. Oh my fucking god! Anybody can do what they want, but I'm just it's I'm driven to distraction. Losing my religion, as they say in the South, over these people who are still trying to act like that these are legitimate professional wrestlers that need to be on national television in the United States of America. Or even in Japan. They used to have some standards over there. That New Japan women's dojo in the 90s would have fucking killed an Olympic athlete. And now it's fucking failed. All Japan fucking, women's dojo. All Japan. I'm sorry. There was no well, you know, New Japan women's There dojo. was no, I, but I'm all fucking fired up here. The goddamn uh, uh, failed teenage pop idols become cartwheeling 98 pound wrestlers. And now we got to look at them on our TVs because one guy has got a fetish. I don't get it. Go ahead. What do you got? This well, you is know, your I was going to bring up something. Um, and, and I'm going to hope that you listen to the point as opposed to opine about the quality of the content. <laughs> but I've noticed lately some AEW hardcore fans who are upset about the way the women's division is being used. Now, I'm not talking about the booking. I'm not even talking about the quality of matches. But, for instance, last week had Riho versus Serena Deeb. We both said it was the best match on the show, despite it being Riho. The follow-up to that is Riho versus Thunder Rosa isn't on the TV show. It's on YouTube. What? So instead we get Jake Hager versus Brandon Cutler on TV next week. No. So a lot of the what? complaints are it's stop and go. That they have this tournament, you get the match with Riho, which apparently popped the rating a little bit, that match. And then the follow-up is she's on YouTube or she's on Bleacher Report. I forget exactly where it is, but it's not on the TV show. So there are fans that are upset about, and again, you and I have very different opinions of the AEW women's division and some of the hardcore AEW fans. All right, fans. but just in, just in a vacuum, yes. you show the first round match, but you don't show the second round match. Right. Well, that's just stupid. I think so. I wonder how many people are going to buy cameos for me to tell Tony Khan he's stupid. Maybe I'll just say, in in the next two minutes, Cornette, book this angle for Tony Khan, and we'll send this to him better than 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 he did. It won't I matter. I guess then they need Tony's phone number. Well, I guess everybody's got Tony's phone number. It won't now. matter. It'll be just... They had his number as soon as they walked in the door. It'll be just like the football team and just like the football club or soccer team over in England. Despite lack of success or despite people killing him for the shoddiness of it, he will insist that he's doing a good job. He insists that he's doing a good job as Booker. And there's now, nothing give, anyone can say to talk him out of it. Give credit to his enablers. Come on. <laughs> he's got some world-class enablers. If there was an enabling championship, the competition for that would be stiffer than any uh, athletic trophy in the world. It makes me feel bad for like Herb Abrams. He only had like Brian Blair and a B team of enablers as opposed to Tony Khan, who has the cream of the crop of the independent wrestling scene as his enablers. Well, where do we go from well, here? Well, where do you go from? It's your show. <laughs> of course, a big feature, something everyone's been waiting to hear is your review of 
Elimination Chamber, the latest oh, okay. WWE pay-per-view event. Now, I have to say this. It's a weird thing with you and the show. People love you talking about modern WWE or reviewing modern WWE. And you kind of want to do it a little bit because people love it. Like I, I've said this before. They, the, peep, the people ask for it. If Basically, you, you tell me that the, the, when the people are demanding shit because you have more of a finger in the people of America than I do, and then I have to suffer for, for our art. But even on YouTube, you know, everyone's like, oh, they only talk about AEW because it's the hot thing. The most minor WWE thing you talk about will do better than the best AEW thing. People love you talking about WWE. The problem is we then have to watch it. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's hard to do. It's really, really hard. There's a reason we gave up on Raw and SmackDown and NXT. <laughs> it's like critiquing McDonald's hamburgers. There's only so much you can say, and then nothing ever really changes. Actually, you're possibly going to be surprised. There were one, one of the Elimination Chamber matches I actually enjoyed quite a bit. I'm going to say probably the first one. Well, I'm not going to tell you yet. <laughs> Are we actually doing this now? I think we should do this now. All right. Well, in that case, I'll tell you. Yes, it was the first one. Oh, my God. And now, <sighs> also, if they haven't already figured out, well, they're not going to figure it out if they haven't by this point. Two Elimination Chamber matches, the reason why they didn't have two War Games matches or two Cage matches or two San Francisco Battle Royals on the same show or two whatever the fuck on the same show. And the only people that usually did repeat some massive gimmick like that twice on the same show were the territories that were going out of business and throwing everything at the wall to see if it would stick. Especially when the first one is put together so much better and executed so much better. That last one was a schlog to get through for that result that we'll talk about. But, uh, Okay, the the first one right off the and and also, goddamn it! It when you put something like that on the show first, who's going to follow it? And and it really sets kind of a shitty level of expectations for the rest of the whole fucking thing, especially when. And then you put the girls tag team match in the death spot where we've seen everything else, but the only other thing we're going to see, and we can't wait for this to be over at this point. Why can't anybody build a show anymore? Just build it. Just start at the beginning and go to the end. You know, when you read a book or you watch a movie. It... Anyway. So the first match on the show was an elimination chamber match with the winner to face Roman Reigns tonight for the title. They said tonight for the title, right? Did they ever say immediately afterwards? Oh, I don't recall. I had a real problem show-wide with the commentators. And apparently when I tweeted about it, every single person agrees with me. It's hard to pay attention to anything they're saying. They talk like morons. They treat you like morons. Michael Cole. I don't want to wish ill on someone. <laughs> but if just something had happened was vocal cords. I would be very happy. Hey, now that's no fun. I've suffered that in the past. He is atrocious. And everyone will say, oh no, if Vince wasn't in his ear, he'd be good. No, he wouldn't. He sucks. His cadence sucks. The words that come out of his mouth suck. Nonstop nicknames. It's the head of the table. Shut up. You're <laughs> garbage. I can't wait for you, you to be gone. And you can't use the name Michael Cole ever again because WWE owns it. <laughs> Idiot. You pick, you pick up garbage. You sleep in the street. You're doing an old Joe LaDuke interview now. I hate you, Johnny Lala. <laughs> you pick up garbage. You sleep in the street. Anyway. The best Joe LaDuke. I, I got to stop you. The best Joe LaDuke <laughs> interview moment, it always gets me, is when he's in the apartment he's, and he smashes. I don't know what it was. It was like no, a, it was a hotel lobby. Hotel lobby. And he smashed, I guess it's like the ashtray thing. It was a, it, it was 1981, and it was one of those big sand-filled glass ashtrays that he was sitting in a hotel <laughs> lobby in the corner with a chair and a 
nondescript end table, a lamp, and that ashtray, and he picked it up and broke it over his fucking head. Cut himself in 17 different places. Well, the best part is he smashes it into his head, and he goes, I got a maid. She can clean this up. And he smashes yeah. it, and it doesn't break. Yeah. And then he like looks at it, and he goes, she can clean up all of this. And he does it the yeah. second time, and then it breaks. That's the best. <laughs> a little ad lib there. Uh, but anyway. I got a maid. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was making a lot of money. He actually, they shot that in Atlanta. He was working in Atlanta and they shot it in whatever hotel he was at at the time. And I guess he said, I'll buy the fucking ashtray or whatever. And they sent it up to Memphis. But anyway, so this first match was Claudio or Cesaro. He'll always be Claudio Castagnoli to me. Daniel Bryan, uh, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, Jey Uso, and the Possum King, Baron Corbin. And four Ring of Honor veterans. Well, and that's, I think, why it was probably, uh, because they all know each other. They all know each other's shit. They're all used to working with each other, and they're unselfish with each other. And also, when you've got, well, Claudio was the star to me of the whole match. Why he is not an absolute top guy there, I have no fucking idea. They're crazy. Um, he was a star of the night to me, to be honest with you. And he and Daniel Bryan started out. And of course they wrestling, imagine that wrestling. And they're so smart with what to do. They had one of the fir- early no crowd pandemic matches and, and uh, because they wrestle and it it's tight and believable, but action, regardless whether there's people there or not, you can't see through it, whatever the fuck. So they're both so smooth. They did. They started in the ring. They did wrestling spots. They did some running and some bumping. And then they went into the cage and then back in the ring. They made the cage a bump into the cage special. Uh, Brian did that big hurricane run off the top rope. They, they built their spots. And then when they sold them, they paid it off. And they, or when they paid it off, they sold them and then went back to wrestling. Claudio did the gotch lift. Uh, they did the forearm trades and they sold their forearms well. They had a great opening session. In a war games or a match like this, you want to put two workers in to start out because that way you they'll keep you busy and their shit looks good, but you can build it. They don't need to go to ripping each other across the fucking fence and bashing each other into the posts right off. Because then here came the Possum King. He was the next one and he beat up both guys on the the not the ramp, but the, I, when I say ramp in this review, the the walkways they have in between the pods outside of the apron that's on the same level as the ring, those ramps, they're hard. But he beat up both guys on the ramp. He's coming in to be a heel, which there's something to be said for that, especially with the second chamber match. But the wrestling quality nosedived. Did you, it it just sort of, because I, I mean, just to the state of him, to look at him. Why is his body tan and his head pale? No, I'm serious. That's a question. <clears throat> Jump in, volunteer and answer. Why would your body be tan and your fucking head and face translucent? I don't know. It looks like he wears the fucking possum fur over his head all the time and gets no sun. Anyway, so the possum king slows the pace down. His gimmick is horrible. As I mentioned, at least he's a heel, just not a good one, but he's dominating these guys. Well, then Sami Zayn was next, and I love this. And again, this fucking guy, his promos, his facials, his chicken shit heel work, his ability to figure out how to be entertaining no matter what the fucking uh, situation and he fought me tooth and nail because I said, learn how to speak English and take the fucking mask off. I was, uh, as soon as his door opens, he slams it shut. He doesn't want to get out and get his, his fucking ass kicked. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. What a fucking weaselly heel. That's what I'm ta- That's the kind of guy, even if you think wrestling is bullshit, a, a chicken shit heel needs to foster the feeling in people that you'd just like to just slap him as much as a monster heel needs to foster in people that the oh, fuck I'm scared of him. It's the same thing. So finally he, he held the door shut and Daniel Bryan stopped 
Possum King, but then Claudio got Sammy from the other side, and Sammy took a fucking entertaining ass kicking. And he got bounced off the cage, and he uh, goes to the top of the pod, but Claudio Cesaro follows him. And they shimmy across the side of the cage. This was fun. They're using the 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 cage and the gimmick without just bashing each other into it repeatedly over and over and making grunting noises. There's some variety in this. And it's it's funny, but it's organic comedy. It looks like Zane would be a person that would try to get away and do that, and Claudio's a guy that would follow him and just fuck with him and do that. And then when Cesaro kicked him off and did the chin-ups, what a fucking beast he is, right? I, as, at, at that point, I wrote, I wish they'd get Corbin out of here. He's just cluttering things up. And finally, as soon as I said that, Cesaro, big swing on Corbin, put the sharpshooter on him, and he tapped out. Thank God. Here comes Owens. Now Zane rehabilitates some of his heat from getting rattled around by saying, hey, what about you and me, Kevin? We're old buddies. Our history. Yeah, they wouldn't let him say, I'm sure, what he wanted to say. And Owens then fucking rattles him off everything, and he's bouncing around like a ping pong ball. And I've said many things about Steen before, and he is just a French-Canadian pain in the ass. But all these guys that from that era of Ring of Honor understood how to keep things moving and and build something, and yes, they were accused of doing too much until we've seen the last 10 years. But they're they're willing to work with each other and get their shit over, right? Anyway, it, it kept moving. It was somewhat logical. Everybody in this match was a clear heel or baby face in their own way. Even though it was five, six guys, everybody for themselves, or um, five guys, however many fucking guys was in it. <clears throat> Even though it's every man for himself, the second match, as we'll talk about, the second chamber match got this all muddied up. There were faces and heels in this match, and even though sometimes the heels were fighting the heels, the babyface were fighting the babyface, they did shit that these guys would do. Daniel Bryan didn't try to end the fucking career of goddamn Kevin Owens or whatever. The Anyway, um, they did a nice four-way exchange of the big moves that everybody did that were timed well and they sold them and everybody was down. Here comes Uso in. And now Owens goes to him and he's all over him because he's mad about the rumble. And now he's really ripping the face across the wire and bashing him into it violently, not in a funny way. Like, you know, and, and Sami Zayn selling it like, oh, but it's more brutal now because there's a personal grudge. Boom, bashed him into the pod. And uh, they knocked the back out, which really took the fucking shine off some more of their shit in the second chamber match. Another reason not to have two of these things. Owens had to get his moonsault in off the top on everybody. But at that point, in a something like this, it wasn't egregious. Um, Hit Daniel Bryan with a stunner, hit Cesaro with a stunner, forgot to duck Sami Zayn's kick. <laughs> and Sami went over his head anyway. And stunned Sami Zayn, one, two, three. That was a nice finish. That got the fake people up. But it, you, it, it got the pace up. It got the emotion up. And then immediately, as soon as he's looked that good, Uso slams the door on Owens' arm and fucking traps it and kicks him in the head about five times and frog splashes him, one, two, three, and he's gone. What'd you think of that? The idea that he got his arm caught in the door. Well, he didn't get his arm caught in it. He got his arm slammed well, in you know it. What I, I mean. like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I bet, I mean, he'd have been kind of a putz if he just got stuck. But no, I like that because they're using the playing field in somewhat of a plausible way instead of, you know what? The best thing about this was there wasn't any weapons in it. They didn't put a hat on a hat, right? They didn't have to drag tables and ladders and shit in because they're already in a gimmick. When you're in a gimmick and you've accepted the play, this is the playing field for our gimmick match, and then you come up with creative ways. I liked it when, oh, who was it got their leg stuck in a Thunderdome cage? Or the fight pit. It was the fight pit, the last Champa. fight pit they had. Yeah. Champa got his leg stuck in but because there happened to be a gap. I like shit like that. I, I, that's what I pitched to fucking Fritz himself for Texas Stadium and 
85, the match between Flair and Kevin. It took place in two rings because they had a two-ring 10-man Zabada. And they wanted to do a count-out. I said, don't do the count-out with them fighting on the floor, dragging each other off the apron that everybody, that Bruiser Brody has made famous here in Texas. I said, have them counted out in between the rings that are setting next to each other, and they're on the aprons of those. So technically, shouldn't that count as a playing field? But technically, they're out of the ring. And you have your main referee wiped out in the previous match. You put in a rookie referee. He makes a fucking questionable call, and you send it to the Alliance. You know what they did? I don't remember the finish. They did the fucking double pull each other off the apron until a referee counts 10 finish. <laughs> I'm shocked. I never heard this story before. That I know that towards the you end. You never of your, heard that. Well, I know towards the end of your run in world class, they started including you in the booking meetings, but I never knew that you actually pitched to Fritz an idea for the finish of that match. Well, he was. I pitched it to everybody, but Fritz was the main one that because I was trying to get it. David Manning, Bronco Lubich, Gino Hernandez, Chris Adams, um, myself, Fritz, uh, Kevin. I Boy, think was there. And they said the 89 booking committee was too large. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, see the, and, and, and Gary Hart, Gary, it wasn't even really a, everybody. They were just wanting ideas for the stadium show. And basically I've already said it, but just to clarify, Flair was defending the NWA world title against Kevin and the match was going to be able to be taking place in both rings that they had set up. And they came up with, they wanted to do a count out because the boys couldn't get beat, but they, at the same time, they weren't going to switch the belt. And I just thought that was a blase, a double count out because, you know, Kevin hits the big cross body and they go over the top or whatever the fuck and they don't get back in. And that's why I said, why don't Rick get the heat? Kevin make a big comeback, hit his fucking big cross body, one, two, Barely fucking Flair kicks out. Flair tries to escape to the other ring. As he gets into the, uh, gets out of the ropes in one ring and is going to the other one, Kevin fucking meets him and they fight for a second there and Kevin fucking hits him and he takes a bump into the other ring. And Kevin does another big flying crossbody. Boom, one, two, oh, almost in that ring. Flair's trying to get out the other way, back the other to the other ring. He gets out. And before he can get in the second ring, Kevin catches him again and puts the fucking claw on him. Now he's got the iron claw and fucking Flair and Flair's arms are fucking flailing. And the people are screaming. But the referee who would have been, God, was it Ralph Pulley? They had a junior referee at that point. And I said, hurt David Manning in the previous match. Rick Hazard. And well, Rick was still fairly fairly uh uh experienced the point is they were just starting a new referee i said put the new referee out there because you got to have a fucking out that's where you want your out for kevin your appeal to the commission anyway the referee behind kevin's back is counting because they're on the aprons that are touching each other in between the two rings and as he's counting flares drooping he's counting flares drooping and when flares shoulders hit the mat in on the apron there and Kevin's got the claw on it should be about 8 because that's when the referee goes 9 10 call for the bell the fucking Kevin jumps up thinks he's won the people probably would too and he announces it's a double count out and they fucking haul Rick out of there i said now you got a little controversy because you can appeal that to the NWA and blah 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 they went with the other one. <laughs> Did anyone support you? Did anyone think that you had the no, better idea? No, no. Oh, absolutely not. Because that was the first time I'd been in one of the booking meetings <laughs> and they didn't want me to come back. Did anyone because... ask you your thoughts on how to book the Midnight Express and the Fantastics with Little John? I Well, I, I gave them a few there. <laughs> and, uh, right, that's I the same Texas that Stadium too. show. Yeah. No, there's the thing. Gino and Chris didn't want me to come back because if I was in the booking meetings, then they would, I would, the Midnight Express possibly might be featured more. And I, Gary, I assume wouldn't give a shit because he was over it at that point. Anyway, he just was coming in to help out. Um, David Manning wanted to be the booker 
uh, Ken Man and well, Ken Mantell obviously was the booker. I forgot to mention he was there. Ken Mantell was the booker, and he definitely didn't want me in any more meetings because Ken Mantell's complicated finishes were small package one, two, three. Um, and he didn't he was way in over his head. So and and we were leaving shortly because as soon as that Texas Stadium match happened and we got our check, that's when we fucking called Crockett. So I wouldn't have been around for too many more booking meetings anyway. Anyway, back to this fucking other show. <laughs> oh, good Lord. So anyway, now I was liking this match. Maybe, as a matter of fact, when you put this on YouTube, put that story in a separate clip, and that way people will be able to follow this. Uh, Daniel Bryan and Cesaro, again, uh, had a great exchange for several minutes. It was great. I had to write down where was everybody else because I penalize all the matches when everybody disappears for a long period of time, but this was good. It held your attention. Uh, Cesaro did the gut buster off the top on Daniel Bryan and the one legged big swing. That was fucking great. Um, Uso in splashed Cesaro one, two, three splashed Daniel Bryan, got a two count splashed him off the pod. Bryan got his knees up, hit the knee to the head. One, two, three. Great. I, I thought it was a great job by everybody. Uso wasn't in much, but what he did, he did well. The other guys, they kept it moving. They built it from a start to a a, n a number of crescendos. But overall, you know, they 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 took you on a roller coaster, and nothing was egregiously stupid. And they ended up with, and everybody nailed their finish. You know, so <clears throat> as far as the match, I liked it. And then I found out that that Daniel Bryan gets his title match tonight, right immediately. And I'm like, well fuck this ain't gonna last long and it didn't yeah you know i liked this elimination chamber like you better than a second one although i thought the second one was all right however in both cases i hated the post-match match i guess we could say yeah, <laughs> because they weren't one this, this way i know daniel bryan was there in, in the overall scheme of things to be fodder to get some more heat on roman reigns but one wonders, wouldn't it have been not only a little bit more credible, but also just just a little more dramatic if Daniel Bryan had been selling at the end of this thing and fucking Heyman comes out and cuts a promo saying now and Reigns is fresh. You've got 30 minutes to get your shit together or whatever. And you show him in the back and they're icing his knee and they're doing whatever you do to fucking freshen a guy up. It's just been through a 45 minute fight and, and then have the match and let him do a little something since you've gone that far with poor old Daniel, but it, he got the yes lock. Roman Reigns just broke it, just powered out of it, grounded and pounded him, power bombed him, elbowed him and choked him. And he didn't even tap. He just passed out more or less. Didn't he? Yeah. And that was it. That was it. Boom. And then Edge came in and speared Roman Reigns and pointed at the WrestleMania sign. If you wanted Edge to come in and spear Roman Reigns, why wouldn't you let Daniel Bryan have a four or five minute match with him where Bryan gets, gets some offense, Reigns is stopping him, gets some fucking heat, give Bryan one hope spot and shut him down, and then fucking beat him and keep the heat going there where edge could come in and make a save instead of just, well, fuck you. I won't walk in and challenge you man to man face to face. I'll come in from behind you and spear you for no reason. Otherwise, and we're mad at each other. It just, it, it would help the flow of the activity in front of your eyes. Wouldn't it? I guess, like I said, it kind of brought this down a little when you get to the end of the show and you realize they did a whole, thing at the end of that match too but overall i thought it was a good elimination chamber match i wish they could have done more with daniel bryan versus roman reigns but i guess we'll see how things play out in the weeks ahead or we won't that's, see it but we'll hear about that it. sounded like dramatic foreshadowing yeah we better not see it <laughs> <clears throat> what show are they on though smackdown smackdown that's the one we haven't tried yet are we we tried it a while back a while back i don't know <laughs> Sounds like we're talking about meth. Hey, we tried it a while back, but that shit, no. Anyway, 
The next match for the United States title was the aforementioned, we were talking about him earlier, um, little Matt Riddle versus John Morrison versus Bobby Lashley. And I've always said I'm a fan of, of Morrison's. And I, the, Bobby Lashley, I don't know why he's not a goddamn... Well, he, they are using him on top now, but why he hasn't been a big star in this company for a while. And they've let him go in the past. He's been other places and he's blah, blah, blah. I, you know, I don't see what they haven't seen in the past. He's the real deal. He looks tremendous. The way he, he's moving like a cat. And we talked about how old he is here uh, a while back on one of the shows. Um, he's got to be 275. He moves like a cat and he's in his forties now. So anyway, is he not? Didn't we determine that? I want to say we determined he was like 45. I'll double check, but yeah, yeah, he's not a, he looks better than he's ever looked in his entire career, but he's in his mid forties, I believe. But, uh, but anyway, I, of course we can't have a singles match. That would have been uh, uh, wonderful, but at, as a triple threat match, I even wrote this. I said, if this match is to make a beast out of Lashley, I agree wholeheartedly. And that's what he did for most of it is he beat up everybody. And Morrison is still so athletic and he nails some shit. Boom. And, but at the same time now, by the way, when less, when Lashley was on Riddle, that's what Dr. Death versus Riddle would have looked like, except Doc has probably, Doc wasn't cut like Lashley, but he had probably 20 pounds on him. Um, and then they finally, as they should have had a double team to get Lashley down. And then as soon as they do immediately Morrison, cause he's a heel turns on fucking riddle. So that's, that's fine. But I thought that toward the end of it, it got messier and more confusing when Lashley wasn't the centerpiece and just showing what a beast he was. But finally, however, they MVPs on a crutch. I assume it's legitimate injury, but. MVP is a heel manager, yes, but he also was a uh, a wrestler formerly, and he just Morrison just goes out and backs MVP down and takes his crutch away from him. Couldn't he have shoved the the guy with the injury down and takes it away from him instead of emasculating him by just here, give me your crutch? And then he goes to hit Lashley, but Lashley stops him, and while Lashley's got uh fucking Morrison in the full Nelson. Riddle hits Lashley with the crutch twice and fucking pinned Morrison to win the U.S. title, which Lashley held, so which is exposed the biggest part of the bullshit in the bullshit rules that these three-way matches have is that the champion doesn't need to get pinned, which is lunacy. So that just leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. But now, on the bright side, at least it keeps Lashley strong because he didn't actually lose anything. Well, yes, but don't switch the goddamn belt then. If you've got plans for, and they do because Lashley comes out later on, don't fucking have Lashley lose anything right now. It's not just because it's Riddle, but if you're going to be using, figuring him in a fucking bigger position... I, I, I don't know, I, but, but they're going to say it's storytelling out there in Twitterville. It's storytelling because now they open up all these things where Miz and Morrison and Riddle and Lashley and blah, blah, blah. Muddying the water. What do you think? On the topic of Riddle, I remember when he was wrestling for Gabe Sapolsky in Evolve. People raved about him. People said how he was a natural, how great he was, how he didn't have his marijuana habit he'd be on the main roster how he reminds them this is the one that still gets me he reminds people of Kerry von eric i've yes that is just lunacy that's not why because he has long hair why <sighs> but i thought he was all right in nxt i think his whole shtick the whole bro thing and no one is a bigger proponent of flip-flops than i am but the flip-flops and the bro thing it's just to me, it's lame. Now he doesn't even have a real name. Now it's just Riddle. But I don't get it, and I don't see it with him. In fact, that now that we know that he's 35, he's not even a young guy, well, relatively young for wrestling, that also makes you question it, but I don't get it. I, I watch this, and I'm like, this is someone people have raved about, and I simply don't see it. I also don't see him 
as someone who has the ability to have mass appeal. And I know other people have. So, you know, sometimes you watch a wrestler and you're like, man, people like Masa Chono, just to throw a name out there. People rave about Masa Chono. And every time I watched him, I said, this guy isn't good. I don't get it. I don't get it with this guy. People love him, but I don't get it. And Matt Riddle, same thing. I just don't understand the appeal because I don't think he really has that big of an appeal. Somebody called Matt Riddle cosplay Rob Van Dam. Well, uh, but again, I'm, why? Because he smokes weed? I mean, there's... Well, and and and, and flips sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I don't fucking know. I don't know. But certainly, I don't get the Kerry Von Eric thing in any way. I don't. I don't understand. No, that. He, he reminds me of Kerry Von Eric's right leg. That's not. That's not right. <laughs> what? Well, that's. I'm just. That's the closest the comparison I can make. He's about the same size as Kerry Von Eric's right leg. That's the closest comparison I can make to him and Kerry Von Eric. Anyway, you know what was next, don't you? I think I do, but I didn't write down the order of events. The big women's tag team championship contest with Bianca Belair and Sasha Banks against Shayna Baszler and Nihole Jax. <laughs> and you told me to watch this thing. You said, well, watch it, but, but first, here's well, what you told me. Yeah, that's not exactly what I said. Well, you thought there was going to be a women's elimination chamber match, and I said, you got to be kidding me. He said, no, oh, I think they were at a women's elimination, which would have just been insane. And I was prepared to have to watch that. So when they didn't, I was relieved, and I tried to watch this, and I forgot to make any notes. <laughs> because i was just sitting there i did a couple of things nia Jax is the plowboy frazier of women's wrestling <laughs> that is funny <laughs> um <sighs> if plowboy frazier had a very famous cousin who got him a job well if if lawler had been his cousin lawler got him 18 jobs so they just weren't related but um I mean, yes, Bianca Belair is very athletic and Sasha Banks is very athletic and Shayna Baszler is a shooter and Nia Jax is plowboy and they did wrestling moves and I don't, I didn't see anything to, well, besides the usual stuff with Nia Jax, I didn't see anything to really hoot and holler about as far as how bad it was because I wasn't paying real close attention, but I also didn't particularly see anything that I just was flipped my shit about. So somehow Reggie brought some champagne out, but it backfired and his team lost and they got, and then he got yelled at. What'd you think? Eh, <laughs> I mean, I hated the promo before the match. They had Bianca and Sasha. Talking backstage, remember, Bianca won the Royal Rumble. She gets to pick which champion she faces at WrestleMania, so Sasha's one of the candidates. But they do this thing. It's not unique to this promo, where the interviewer says, I'd like to welcome Bianca Belair. And then, from what I guess is a foot off camera, Bianca <laughs> Belair walks into the screen. They do a close-up of her face, not looking at the interviewer, not looking into the camera, just looking off to nowhere and then they go back to the interviewer and she introduces here's sasha banks she does the same thing walks on from a foot away doesn't look at bianca doesn't look at the commentator the announcer doesn't look into the camera just looks to the rafters that aren't there because they're in the back and there are no fans to begin with and then once they establish that no one knows how to behave normal <laughs> then they do the <laughs> promo you know, when I watch a Nia Jax match, I'm just watching for the botches at this point. I'm just watching who will she hurt? How will she mess up? She doesn't belong here. She's not a quality female wrestler. Other than that, it was it was okay. It was okay. And it's just, it's, it's also the fact that she seems to have no sense of timing with what's going on around her, it's almost like the thing I joked about Mantar. He would, he would charge and the guy would move and he'd hit the buckle and he'd back up about a foot or two and he'd go for 10 seconds and then turn around. 
Where else is the guy going to be but behind you? You're looking at the only other part of the ring. It, it just... <clears throat> <clears throat> Here's another thing I wondered about before we go on to this final Elimination Chamber match. The guys in the pods are miked. Why? They know that. Why can nobody believably trash talk? It all sounds like shit that people are saying on purpose. Just a thought. Well, before we get to the final match, did you not see Bad Bunny backstage? I, I zipped through Bad Bunny. I was running late on time. He made The Miz look like a fool, but thankfully The Miz is just a mid-card guy, not someone getting a big push. So it was acceptable. Bad Bunny, of well, course, the night before, was on SNL with the 24-7 championship which means nothing and no one cared but he's a big star and you're and you're mad at me cuz i didn't watch this pre-tape aren't you now no i i'm completely fine that you didn't watch one of their awful backstage segments and he made miz an idiot well he didn't make him an idiot god did that <laughs> but he just <laughs> but he further highlighted yes that's that right miz is a buffoon a that's fucking right. foon that's as Jim Ross would say. Very good. <laughs> That's right. Now can we move on to the Elimination Chamber match? Please, please, yes. All right. As much as I praised the first match, which was fully praiseworthy for me, right? I didn't, I didn't hardly piss on it at all. This one was everything in the opposite direction. And it, it made me, while I was not enjoying the match, it made me look at, at what they were doing technically, and I enjoyed it even less. Did you notice the cameras, besides the fact that the Elimination Chamber is supposed to be this dangerous, you know, fucking environment where everybody's putting their lives on the line, there's two floor camera guys in the cage, just over in the corner, shooting everything. They're not nervous, but besides that, they had the cat there. It was like 90s WCW. They're standing on the ring apron. They're shooting at eye level with the guys standing up in the ring. So they're shooting down on bumps. They're shooting at the same level as the guys. A hard camera, as they call them, or the play-by-play -play camera up in the stand shoots down, yes, to get the entire scene of the ring. And from a distance, or from that kind of distance, the bumps still look big, and the guys still look bigger than life. But when you've got a floor camera or a handheld camera, we call them floor cameras, because they should be on the floor. When you've got a handheld that's as tall as the guys in the ring, a body slam, you're looking down at it. You see what I'm saying? A backdrop is not as big because you're not looking up at it. And the guys are not as big because you're not looking up at them from a handheld shooting up from the floor. And that was very 90s WCW-ish when they started letting the goddamn the television production overwhelmed the wrestling rather than the other way around. And I just don't, I, I don't like that. It, it diminishes some of the things. And they started this match completely opposite of how I've, I've said that they, I really liked the way they started the, the first match. And somebody's going to say, well, of course they were trying to do something different. Well, my response is if you can't do it right, just don't have two of these matches on the same fucking show. Orton and Hardy, started on the, the ramp out, you know, around the apron and were bashing each other off the cage and fighting, you know, uh, with no bumps and no running and no real spot spots right off the start. Then they fucking bump into the ring and grab a fucking hold. That, so it was almost reverse what they did before. So they started off with the fighting into the cage and, and bashing each other off of that and then go in the ring and, and grab a hold and then Orton stops Hardy and gets methodical heat in this first fucking segment. Um, I thought that slowed it down. I didn't know Orton would be making such a quick exit. I don't know if Orton knew he'd be making such a quick exit because that obviously wasn't what they were trying to do later on. Uh, then McIntyre comes in <clears throat> here once again start remember i said how the guys in the first match even though they were babyface and heels they kind of did even when they fought each other what those people would do well here comes drew mcintyre who has been 
portrayed as as you know the, their brand new face of the company type baby face supposedly all year beat Brock Lesnar blah 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 of course he's going to kick Randy Orton's ass but then he grabs Jeff Hardy he fucking suplexed him into the fucking cage and on the ramp and then lawn darted him into one of the pods trying to fucking end his career what has Jeff Hardy done to Drew McIntyre that he should do those things to him you see what I'm saying yeah he just went to we're just all going to do devastating moves to each other regardless of whether that's our personalities or whether can you can you see if this match was taking place in the Hogan era Hogan coming in and picking up Tito Santana and just fucking spearing him into the goddamn cage for no reason and it's some people would boo Hulk Hogan because now you're 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 supposedly forcing these baby faces fans to pick whose side they're on. And anytime Drew McIntyre beats up another obvious baby face, he's, he's splitting his perception. Anyway, Kofi Kingston comes in next and his gear looks like a unicorn puked and he's wearing tennis shoes. And what the fuck? He had a sloppy fight with Randy Orton with basically no bumps. They just sloppy fighted. And then Orton stopped him with a broad arm and told him something and then stood up and fed him a leg and he looked like he was almost going to roll into a fuller leg lock but didn't instead just did something that Randy stayed down for one two three what the fuck was that I don't know I was surprised by that it's nothing I've ever seen before, and it obviously wasn't meant to be that way. That's the only thing that we can say with any degree of certainty. And it was very odd. These are both athletic guys. They could have gone into some kind of spot, up and over, down, boom, roll up, whatever the fuck. But they just had a sloppy fight. Randy stops him, picks him up, tells him something, and then stands there and then gets fucking half-assed rolled up in some kind of way. And then it wasn't that Orton was telling him, I'm hurt, pin me now. Because as soon as that happened, Orton jumps up, RKO's Kofi, RKO's Jeff Hardy, and fucking leaves in a in a huff with the aside that we shall neither nod nor speak again to Kofi and Hardy. I mean, what was that? How could, I'm trying to figure out how somebody could have laid it out verbally and them gone over it and it come out looking like that i don't know who agents these matches well i guarantee you that wasn't their <laughs> thought or recommendation not how it turned out at least uh anyway at this point aj Styles' giant eight foot bodyguard amos ripped aj's plexiglass sheet out so AJ could escape from the pod and the announcers acted like it was goddamn Superman busting through the bank vault. Besides the fact that somebody had got thrown into the plexiglass in the previous match and it knocked the back right out of it, you could see that it was just fucking plexiglass. It wasn't Kane ripping the cage door off. Was it? Did I miss something? Did he have to rip off a metal... Uh, a trim around this or exert some type of superhuman strength or did he just pull the plexiglass out it looked like he got his fingers underneath the bottom of it and then just yanked on it well hopefully if i ever <laughs> go off a fucking bridge into a river in my car and need to escape I, i'll have amos in the car with me so adam pierce comes and kicks amos out of ringside out of ringside but let aj stay in the match Um. And then Drew McIntyre beat up Jeff Hardy some more, like he owed him trans. Then AJ beat up Kofi and Drew. Then Kofi beat up AJ and Drew. And that's when I wrote this. There's no heel or face or story here. It's guys doing equivalent things to each other. They're, and who am I supposed to cheer for? Because they're all acting like pricks. And then Drew suplexed Kofi into the fucking ramp. And then kill jeff hardy again how in this scenario in this match how is it possible to cheat how does a baby face get sympathy how does a heel get heat how does a big move register in the first match they timed and spaced out their big moves and their all uh, oh shit moments or whatever 
and so that they could sell them afterwards. And Reg, this is just back and forth. And then here comes Seamus. Seamus comes in and gets in a hockey fight with Drew McIntyre. It lasted forever before anybody did anything. And then here was another thing. Seamus starts grinding Drew McIntyre's face into the cage. We've now had two cage matches with a dozen of the fucking top guys in the company, not one ounce of blood, not one drop of blood in two main event cage matches. What? If you don't, if you can't have blood in a cage match, it's like a low fat Twinkie. If you can't stand eating the fat, don't have the fucking Twinkie, right? If you can't have blood, why have a cage match? So at, at this point, I've Kofi dove on everybody, but he didn't beat anybody. I kind of zoned out. Then Seamus beat Kofi, then Drew beat Hardy. And then that, that was Jeff swantoned AJ and was going to, and had him, right? Was going to beat him there. But then Drew McIntyre comes and hits a Claymore kick on Jeff Hardy as soon as he stands up from his blind side and pins him one, two, three. What a baby face. He hits the other baby face from the blind side with an unexpected fucking move, one, two, three. That... You're telling me that they could not have figured out a way for potentially AJ to fucking defeat Jeff so that he wouldn't have to go down to Drew, oh, for fuck's sake. Anyway, AJ goes for the springboard flip on Drew McIntyre. Did you see this one? And landed right on fucking top of him. Yeah, I did see that, and it really stuck out because, I mean, I... It was pretty stiff. How do you it, yeah. let that happen? Jesus. Well, it, if you go back and watch when AJ did the springboard and he got up on top, AJ never bobbles. AJ's balance is like a cat. He never, you know, fumfers or whatever. He sprung up and put his feet on the top rope, and then there was a double pump. And from the first pump to the second pump, he started leaning more towards into the ring. So when he kicked off, his momentum took him a little farther. Here's what I couldn't figure out. Was he going for a flip into a leg drop? Because that's kind of what he almost did, but he landed on fucking Drew, his back right on fucking Drew's stomach. Was he going for what he did moments later, which I can't believe Drew McIntyre laid there and led him the second time, which was a fucking, like a 360 splash, right? All the way over into a splash. When he got up to the top rope, did he see that Drew was in a disadvantageous place and tried to modify, probably, and it didn't fucking work? But goddamn, after the first one, seconds later, he's got him back in position. He goes out, he does another springboard into a spot. I'm like, fuck you. Try that again in this match. I will not be there. And then here comes Seamus, and he grabs AJ. Now, Seamus. Is Why a, do you is, call is, him that? That's the way it's spelled. S-E-A-M-U-S. It's an H. No, there's not. Yes, there is. I've seen it S-E-A-M-U-S. It's S-A... Hold on. Now you got me questioned. Shame us WWE. It's S-H-E-A-M-U-S. Well, I've only seen it without an H. Where did you see this? What are this? you looking at? I'm looking at... Wikipedia. I'm looking at his official WWE Twitter account. His well, official WWE wanna, page. <laughs> you want to be all fucking official. <laughs> anyway, so here's what I didn't understand here. Sh Sheamus <laughs> grabs AJ by the hair and is trash talking him in the face and bullying him around. Is Sheamus not a heel? He's a heel, right? I think. He, because when he and McIntyre got face to face with each other they were fucking throwing hands so why is a, a heel trash talking another heel how, how are you going to get heat trash talking the little weasley heel i don't and aj suddenly starts selling like a baby face but then sheamus come back sheamus sheamus come back a hit fucking mcintyre with one of those kicks but aj Hits him with the phenomenal forearm from behind like McIntyre did to fucking Hardy and steals it. And then 
McIntyre hit AJ with a kick when AJ went for another springboard. McIntyre hit him with his Claymore kick in midair, one, two, three. And the timing on that, I have to say, was beautiful. And not a lot of margin for error. Wonderful there. However, Drew McIntyre still the champion. Then here comes Lashley, who just didn't win his match, regardless whether he didn't get beat, he didn't win. And he kicks the complete out shit out of Drew McIntyre in a very convincing manner and leaves him laying. So, okay. In that case, I think we'll probably see Lashley and McIntyre for the title at WrestleMania. That would make sense. Except what the... F Here comes Frog Face with the briefcase. That stupid briefcase, the money in the bank thing, that stupid idea that everybody has copied. And they do it the same way every time. It might have got heat the first five or six times. The champion is down. Here comes the guy to cash in. The announcers actually said Drew said he could go when you could clearly see that he had not said he could go because he didn't say anything because it would be stupid for him to say he could go. They probably mixed up their notes with Daniel Bryan previously who did say that he could go. But it would negate the heat if Drew had said that here, and Miz basically did his third-rate version of Dennis Condry's face buster, sloppily. One, two, three. The fucking Miz. Miz the frog face. After all that they've put into Drew McIntyre, <laughs> Miz the frog face beats Drew McIntyre for the WWF, one of the world championships. What the fuck? Seriously? Is it, even if it's a swerve, okay, they're going to do something on TV or at the pay-per-view in between now and WrestleMania where Miz drops the thing to so-and-so, but it's going to sweeten up the real world title match at WrestleMania or whatever, but still, for fuck's sake, that, that was a shit ending to a, an unexceptional match in my opinion. Well, here are the sad here here are the sad options we have. McIntyre could win the title back before WrestleMania. I said this when he lost the title to Randy Orton. He shouldn't be losing the title. He won it for Brock Lesnar last year at WrestleMania. <laughs> Should have just been a complete year killing people, establishing himself as a new star. And then won this match just as he did and then Lashley jump him just as he did and then go to WrestleMania hopefully as they are, and that would have made sense. Bingo. And you set up that Lashley lost the U.S. title without actually losing the match. So he's strong. Lashley McIntyre, world title, universal title. I don't know what is what anymore. At Mania. Here's the other sad option. Are we going to get the Miz defending the WWE world title or universal title, whatever it is, against Bad Bunny at <laughs> WrestleMania? I <laughs> know. No, I don't think even they have the balls to do something like that. They would know what kind of shit they would take. I think they have the balls to do something like that. He's selling merch better than anyone they have there. He's a big star. He wants to do more in wrestling. They've what set him up with this thing with the Miz already. I mean, it's basically him and Damian Priest against the Miz and Morrison is the feud they've set up a little bit. I don't think they're going to put Damian Priest in that spot yet. It would be nice if they did, but... Well, that they, they can have a tag match. That'd be just fine. Uh, I don't. Th I think that almost anybody who still sticks with them, any longtime fan especially, would burn their WWE membership cards if they got a world title match of Bad Bunny versus The Miz. We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see. We'll see. And if that does happen. <laughs> then I would like to alert everyone to someone that can help you out because we will all need it. Folks, if Bugs Bunny faces Frog Face Miz for the WWE Championship at the main event at WrestleMania, I urge all of you now to contact BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a professional counseling service done securely online that we could all talk to in a moment of crisis, whether it's Bugs Bunny potentially being the WWE champion or any other problem you might have. If you don't want to go out in public, if you don't have therapy available in your area, 
If you don't want to go in the middle of a pandemic and sit in a waiting room, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. You can change counselors to find the right fit. They want you to start living a happier life today. You can go to BetterHelp, better, H-E-L-P dot com, betterhelp dot com slash J-C-E. And right now, you can get 10% off your first month's services, betterhelp.com slash J-C-E, and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. And we thank the folks at BetterHelp for sponsoring the drive through and giving 10% off the first month's services to all of our Cult of Cornet members. Speaking of the Cult of Cornet members, we have a lot of questions from them that we still have to get to here today, Jim, on the drive through That's your fault. This is your show. Our first question, sent to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Trevor. Hello, Jim and Brian. Have you seen Bow Wow's recent Twitter activity? <laughs> Wait, what? Bow Wow. Do you know who Bow Wow is? <laughs> I'm blank on Bow Wow. Is is this like is this Scooby Doo sidekick? Well, he used to be Lil Bow Wow. Now he's just Bow Wow because he's grown up. Oh, okay, that one. Now I know it. What the fuck are you nabbering about? He's a rapper of oh, some boy. renown who was discovered by Snoop Dogg, and then I think he worked with Jermaine Dupri. S- Snoop Dogg discovered Bow Wow. I think that's how he got the name Bow Wow. If I had to take a guess. But anyway, have you seen Bow Wow's recent Twitter activity? I've somehow, I have not uh, perused Bow Wow's Twitter recently. He has been going back and forth with WWE wrestlers. And the other day he tweeted, quote, Every morning I wake up, it's a wrestler who is subtweeting me in their feelings. Get over it! I'm already helping you get over by tweeting you. Instead of hitting the gym eight times a week, Work on your promos. Build some character. That's where we differ at. End quote. There are reports that he is now currently training with Rikishi in California. (laughs) So what are your thoughts on Bow Wow telling the wrestlers to work on their promos and build some character? (laughs) Well, why not? I mean, What 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 cliche applies here? Out of the mouths of babes, sooner or later, even a blind squirrel finds a nut. You pick the. Uh, he's right, but it boy, it's it's a shame to have to hear it from some fucking jack off rapper instead of somebody in the business. But he's right. You know, Vince doesn't have much competition out there, and a lot of the wrestlers are currently tied up with AEW, who are free agents or not in WWE, I should say. In the past, we've seen what he's done, destroyed territory after territory, promotion after promotion, stealing top talent, and making them his talent. Nowadays, when he signs a wrestler, he wants to give them a new name, a new gimmick. But we've seen now with Bad Bunny, and we don't know where things are going now with Bow Wow, do you think Vince is now raiding the music roster for stars (laughs) that he could add to his wrestling roster? Wait a minute, WrestleMania 38 from the basement of the Stanford office for the WWE Championship. Bugs Bunny versus Bow Wow. Special guest referee Sylvester the Cat. What do you think? And Travis Heckle is going to have a field day with this show. You know, I feel like Jericho will probably be hot that he didn't get that match with Sebastian Bach. <laughs> These musicians are cutting better promos on Twitter than the wrestlers. Well, and, and Pat McAfee, here comes a fucking football player. He was the best heel in the business. Yeah, so let's get him off TV. <laughs> let's get what? him off TV yeah, immediately. It, He's really good at this. Everybody from every other line of work but wrestling seems to have a better grip on how to be a fucking wrestler than people in wrestling. It's... Uh, <sighs> Well, our perk next, up my mood. Our next question is one that several people have sent in. I guess it is something that recently came up on Chris Jericho's little show. Uh, he had Eugene, Nick Dinsmore, as a guest. And here is a quote. 
One time, Cornette tried Cena against Randy in the main event. Counting down 30 seconds, 20 seconds, 5, 4. They went over like 2 minutes and 17 seconds, something like that. (laughs) I remember Cena coming back, doing his tape. It was a good match. Like, yeah, we did really good. Corny is, goddamn, 2 minutes and 17 seconds? Gets his baseball bat and starts beating the windows in the building down from us, hitting his car. Randy just left when he came back. Yeah, every now and then, Cornette's frustrations came out. Is this true? Do you remember an incident because they went two minutes and 17 seconds over time of smashing oh, windows yeah. with your bat? I wouldn't have remembered it was actually Cena and Orton specifically, but well, it, it that wasn't the only time. See, remember, I've told you at the old Davis Arena in Jeffersonville, we were the last tenants in this fucking... It's since been demolished, right? And they've put up some new structures there. But it was this old turn of the 20th century, like train station apparatus looking thing with all these broken windows anyway and just old red brick. And we were the only tenants in this whole complex. So I'd go out and throw some chairs through the fucking windows or goddamn beat on some shit because two minutes and 17 seconds over meant the difference between me and Danny Davis both being able to leave the building by midnight and four in the morning because we were mastering the television show on Super VHS and we really didn't do post-production. So what I was going to have to sit do was sit down from scratch and figure out a way to cut two minutes and 17 seconds out of the VTRs and the other stuff that we were going to place in the program afterwards that had been carefully timed down to the second with verbal in and out cues so that we could drop them in the holes that Danny had left. And we were probably going to have to drop a couple of, at least one minute, two of our commercial spots, 30 seconds each to make up that time. And then going to have to make another edit, which laid another segment onto that super VHS tape earlier than what it was so that we kept it on the master and then dub it over to a beta tape on our beta recorder to make the TV station think that we actually had professional equipment when we handed them a fucking tape. So just them not being able to to hit their time cues caused us hours of extra work, which is why the cardinal sin in OVW was I don't care what you fucking do, even if you fuck up, Don't go over time, which is why that every single one of the OVW graduates, when they went to Raw and they were on live television, could hit their fucking cues. Because in most cases, especially from, oh, say 2002 to 2005, at the end of an OVW show, we would barely be 30 seconds off either way, short or long from where we had wanted to be to begin with. And that's doing live to tape. You got to learn these things, kids. That would they would they have been any happier if I'd have broke the windows out of their car? Did anyone ever react to you doing this? Did Danny ever say, "What are you doing? Please don't beat up the building. Beat up your car, but leave the building alone." Did well, so, no, one of these young guys like Cena or Orton get scared ever at you doing well, this? Well, yes, yeah, because it well it wasn't Danny's building, and it wasn't even our complex. Was the the building out back in the parking lot next door? But I swear to God, one time, I fucking, what happened? Jesus Christ. We're shooting at the old building, live to tape. And somebody did something so fucking egregiously stupid that it screwed the whole segment up. And I came in cutting a promo on everybody and I told Danny how to fucking fix it that we were going to go back and do this and that and i goddamn had a hold of his desk and i turned his fucking desk over when i was yelling at him and then stormed back out and sat back down at the fucking at, at the announcer desk and the fucking camera came back up and right as i said welcome back to ovw i realized wait a minute i just turned daddy's desk over <laughs> he said hey danny has a temper too he wasn't as flashy with it but he was actually a whole lot more dangerous um he knew I was in a zone, and he fucking turned it over. We made a lot of money together, so he 
overlooked some of my picadillos. And, it, and like I said, he wasn't as flashy, but there was that one time that, well, I'll say his name. It's been 20 years. Stefan Gamblin. It's this big six foot seven, 275 pound ex football player that they had fucking signed to a developmental deal, had never wrestled before, had never had any wrestling training before. I was one of the early developmentals. And they were looking for anybody but wrestlers and sending them to us, right? Well, this young man happened to squire Danny's daughter, who was of legal age, out on a night on the, on the town one night, and she didn't come back home until basically daylight the next day. And Danny was waiting on old Stephen Gamlin to pull up behind the Davis Arena there in Jeffersonville at the old place. <laughs> Everybody was kind of standing around minding their own business, but they were waiting on Stefan because Danny's the first one there and everybody knew he was not in a good mood. Stefan pulls up and some of those guys they signed then, that David Nelson, um, Russ McCullough, some of these other guys with football and bodybuilding backgrounds, they had real nice cars. They'd pull up to this junky building where they were making $300 a week on these developmental deals, but they had these nice cars, right? Stephen Gamlin pulls up and he gets out all six foot seven, 300 pounds of him. And Danny Davis comes out five foot six, 210 pounds then because he had a little pot belly. And he looked at that big motherfucker. He said, you, let me just tell you this one time. If you ever take my daughter out overnight and bring her home the next morning, she shows up at daylight. I will pull your fucking eyeball out and skull fuck you, you big football playing motherfucker. Now you slink your ass in my building and you put your bag down and you take care not to get me cross at you again or I will fuck you up. And he walked back in the office. <laughs> and Stefan Gamblin looked because he hadn't been here very long and he's like this gray-headed, short, old fucker. And then a couple of the boys told him he meant what he said and don't try him. And for the rest of the time he was here, which wasn't long because he was the shits and didn't pan out, he didn't irritate Danny Davis anymore. Well, on this time. Danny Davis got stretched on a daily fucking basis in Herb Welch's fucking barn in goddamn Dyersburg. But he was not going to put up with some fucking pampered football player on a contract. On a similar topic, I'll read this question because it kind of ties into this. This was sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from Randall in Concord, North Carolina. I was recently listening to Ryan Nemeth on the Chris Van Villet podcast, and he talked about a time when he was with OVW. You came in after getting a flat tire. He said you stormed into the building cussing like crazy, and he did his best to avoid you that day. Do you have any memories of this day? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to, it's now that he's mentioned the flat tire, it seems like I may have had a fucking flat tire on the way to the arena at one point. Um, but I always liked Ryan Nimeth. I liked Nick and I liked Ryan. You got a kick out of them. So I, I don't remember ever yelling at him and I, it was probably good. He stayed away from me. All right, our next question, Jim, sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from Cherise in Michigan City, Indiana. I recently read an article in the New York Post where Cody Rhodes said that he would be interested in a crossover event with WWE. What are your thoughts? Do you think that Vince would ever in a million years allow this to happen? I also have a link to the interview in the post if you wanted any actual quotes. Well, go ahead and read me some, but, uh, uh, well, of course, what, of course they would like a crossover with the WWE. That would be the ultimate validation. The only outside promotions that WWE has ever even recognized was Smoky Mountain because we were absolutely on purpose, no competition. Um, WCW, after they bought them and took them over, but a currently running national promotion that WWE would do a cross promotion with, that would be, go ahead and give Cody a golden ticket to fucking Willy Wonka's place while he's at it. Who wouldn't love that? I'm looking at this interview. It appears to be centered around the 
match with <laughs> with Red Velvet against Shaq and Jade Cargill. Oh, Jesus Christ. And I will say, before I read this, I haven't read this yet. Cody has a tendency to try to sound a lot smarter than he is. There's a reason why I call him the wrestling sage. It's not that he's a wrestling sage. It's that he really tries hard to be the wrestling sage. <laughs> but let's, uh, this appears to be the question. The question from the New York Post, Dynamite two weeks ago had wrestlers from the NWA, Impact, and New Japan. Is there an end goal in your guys' minds of how you want this idea of talent sharing to affect wrestling? It feels like a throwback to the territory days. I'm guessing the interviewer did not know too much about the territory days. Not too much about the territory days. Here's Cody's answer. I think of All In itself. All In is a show that Ring of Honor helped us with, that Matt, Nick, and myself did all the work for outside of that initial production element, and the reason it was important that the three of us do it is we were able to let all these old rules go away. There's a very dangerous and powerful precedent to set if you literally do put down all the bridges and you do put down all the doors. Again, this is all hypothetical. What is he fucking saying? Again, the wrestling sage. Again, this is all hypothetical. But there is no reason AEW couldn't work with New Japan. We're aware of the world outside. Bullet Club is a big part of our blood in AEW. So there's no reason we couldn't work with New Japan. There's no reason Jacob Fatu couldn't take a step over from MLW and stand across the ring from me. There's no reason that there couldn't be a potential WWE crossover one day. And I don't mean that's a thing that's been discussed or happening, but none of those rules that exist for other places exist for us. Wrestling is really this universal industry. The territory reference that you made, that's fairly accurate. But the part of it that's most accurate was there was a genuine trust. Eddie Graham and Vince Sr., they traded people all the time and made prolific pieces of business out of it and they did it in a way where they introduced these characters in New York, and the next thing you know, they introduce these characters in Florida, and it keeps things fresh, because above all, Wednesday Night War, or not, the main thing we have to do for the fans, uh, the main thing we have to do for fans, excuse me, is put a period on it, for the rest of this run, and I want this company to be around forever, is keep it fresh. It can't get stale. Our doors are open if the business is right, if the moment is right, if the time is right. Our bridges are down. I'll be the one curmudgeon AEW guy to make sure it's all good. Oh, boy. Um, it's not the same as the territories. Yes, of course, Vince and Eddie Graham traded talent. Everybody else did. They, they were not all being seen at the same time. This is what they're, they're missing. You'd use fucking a guy in florida for six months then he'd go to new york for six months or whatever this is so this is not the same type of talent exchange as the territories because this is a national tv show having said that there is no reason why aew can't work with new japan or impact or what big if, let's face it new japan is a niche product that's available to a certain diehard audience in this country that seeks it out and nobody else knows it's around. That's just a fact. And so of course, new Japan wants to work with a company that has a national TV show on in America. Uh, they, they've been working with ring of honor because ring of honor had the next best thing with their syndication. But this is in the, in the Japanese minds, even though I still say ring of honor with all that syndication, and all those broadcast outlets, cumulatively, about the same number of people watch Ring of Honor every week as watches AEW all at one time. Anyway, of course, AEW wants to work with or doesn't mind working with Impact because that's a fucking blessing for Impact because they're the next thing to Invisible as relates to a promotion with television because nobody watches it and they've been through so many different periods of shit that they're never really going to recover. They're going to be that thing that Anthem keeps alive for programming, much like maybe Sinclair's doing with Ring of Honor. 
all these other people that AEW are working with, there is a benefit to those companies really more than AEW. AEW gets the talent, but they don't know what to do with it. But there would be absolutely no benefit whatsoever. I can't even say that line with a straight face. Let's let's say it like this. If somebody came to Vince McMahon and suggested that they do a cross promotion with AEW, he would fire them and kick them in the balls, I'm not sure in which order, and rightfully so. Because that's like the brand name, the established company, validating the existence of the upstart outlaw wannabes. Even if, it, even if AEW was a good show, they wouldn't do it. Especially if AEW was a good show, they wouldn't do it. They'd laugh at it now because the idea of WWE working with them is insane on a business standpoint and to not give, you know, this amateur hour credibility. But if it was a really good show, they wouldn't laugh at it. They just wouldn't do it for more of the reason that it would be a really good show and they wouldn't want to expose guys with a, a better show or better talent or whatever on their air. Fortunately for them, they don't have to worry about that because AEW hadn't hit the part where it's a good show yet. There aren't too many examples of Eddie Graham and Vince Sr. sharing talent at the same time. I mean, Bob Backlund was working TV tapings only for a year building up to his title run when he was working Florida. Yeah, well, you know, you did. You went from one territory to another full time. When you finished unless, up. Yeah, unless you were a major star, like, you know, that was flown from one place to another, the Ernie Lads of the day at the time or whatever, or Dusty then later on, or, you know, a, a handful of guys that would make shots in multiple territories. But yes, they did trade talent, but it wasn't like most of the guys were involved in multiple territories and multiple things at the same time. The way that um, Jerry Jarrett in Memphis got a chance to get so many big names from the AWA for a period of time when he was working with Vern was that Jarrett's major towns ran on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, Memphis, Louisville, Evansville, Lexington, Kentucky, and Vern's big towns all ran on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. So a lot of times he didn't even run those days of the week. Vern ran a light schedule. But anyway, the, the, the point is, yes, Cody's saying that. He knows that there's not a goddamn snowball's chance in hell that, that Vince will ever work with AEW in any time, kind of co-promotion. And nobody will make that happen, ever. He tries so hard to sound smarter than he is. That was a long way around your elbow to get to your wrist, I'll tell you that. Yeah. What he said. I'm looking through other quotes. I won't do them now because it's all about the Shaq and Jade Cargill match, but. Well, and here's another thing. This interview. <laughs> they're, they're talking about it like it's it, like it's what it is. It's a thing we set up to get publicity, and that's the way that they've referred to it ever since. And did you hear, by the way, Tony Schiavone, my old friend Tony of all people, after they powerbombed Sting, the 62-year-old man with spinal stenosis, on live television last week, Tony does an after show podcast and reveals to the fans, Oh, it's okay. Sting was fine afterwards. It was his idea that he take that. No, I swear to God. <laughs> no, multiple people have reported that. That Sting, Tony said, No, Sting said he's fine and it was his idea to take it. They've all just either given up or lost the plot or don't care or just figure, Well, it's a different time now. And nobody has any, and Tony knows if he, if, if he was working for Crockett and did that television and then went to the Charlotte observer and said, well, it's okay. It was Dusty's idea to have his leg broken by the horseman and he's fine. Now he would have been fired immediately. He would have been fired on the phone and told not to come to the office because guys would be looking for him. But 30 years later, it, it's like, he doesn't even. And yes, I expose everybody's business because it's all a big fucking joke now and I want to make sure everybody knows I know it. But if you're working for the company and you're putting yourself on television and attempting to call that shit and get it in any way over and then you, you immediately fucking counteract that as soon as you get off the air, what the fuck? No wonder nobody cares because nobody cares. 
you know, you got to think with this kind of brain trust in AEW that maybe they should look for some help when it comes to managing their business. I think they need business management advice. I think think they need business management help. I think they need somebody to manage their god dang business. And I know exactly who. NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud business system. Folks, if you are in the business of buying or selling clouds or anything else for that matter, if you're grossing a million dollars a year or hundreds of millions, and remember, if you're grossing hundreds of millions of dollars a year, please contact me by email at, well, never, we'll talk about that later. Anyway, right now, you can stop paying for multiple systems that don't give you the information you need when you need it. If you're a business owner, you know that running a business is tough, but don't make it harder on yourself than necessary. Put away the spreadsheets and all the old software that you've outgrown because NetSuite gives you visibility and control. I like to be able to see things and control them. Over your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, everything you need all in one place instantaneously. Join the over 24,000 companies using NetSuite right now. And if you will go to NetSuite, N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E dot com slash J-C-E and take a free product tour, NetSuite dot com slash J-C-E, schedule the free product tour right now. They'll show you how they'll benefit your business, and then all of you can come back and tell me, netsuite.com slash JCE. Well, Jim, another popular topic we received several questions about. I'll read this email here. This was sent to cornydrivethru at gmail.com from Christian Weston Chandler in Ruckersville, Virginia. Oh, I call bullshit on all of that. That's not his name. That's not a place. <laughs> is, it, is it a place? Up. Is it actually a place? I've never heard of it. Ruckersville? I've never had. Is that across the holler from Fuckersville? Well, let's see what Christian Weston Chandler's question is. By the way, he says, P.S. Watch Monster Squad. And I endorse that. Hi, Jim. Hi, Brian. Not sure if either of you have heard. But over the past week, the Fox WWE Twitter account posted a build your team image on Twitter. The way these work is that you get $15, and with that amount, you build a team of wrestlers by choosing from columns of $5, $4, $3, $2, and $1. Obviously, these tiers are based on position and wins and losses, so you get things like Charlotte being in the $5 tier, Shayna Baszler being in the $3 tier, and Liv Morgan being in the $1 tier. Because I apparently Liv Morgan don't win a lot of matches nor have a lot of main events. Well, Natalia, Liv, and Peyton, all of whom are in the $1 column, have taken great personal offense at this <laughs> and complained until it got taken down. <laughs> My question is, Do wrestlers like them really not understand how the company views them? Why lash out on Twitter instead of going to talk to someone in the back? I like Natalia, but she's been with the company for 14 years and has been champion a grand total of three months. If she's so upset about that, why hasn't she left? And I have the tweets attached here. Well, hold on. I don't know if it's about not being champion, but... It's silly because it's a phony fucking game to keep the fans busy on their website. And I can, I can see, and I I can probably agree with one or two of the guys. Oh, God damn it. Hold on here one second. It's, I swear to God, this actually says invalid number one, five, Oh, two, one, nine, three, three. Hold on one second. Hey, you might be an invalid number, but if you call me again, you're going to be an invalid motherfucker. There you go. All, All right. right. I think we'll leave that in, but maybe bleep the number. Oh, fuck you. Everybody call them back and tell them to quit calling me with an invalid fucking number. <laughs> anyway, 
So I can see them being upset. I can see some of the boys going up to the social media guy at the taping and fucking <laughs> looking down at him and pushing him around and making him nervous about it to at least have some fun out of it. But seriously and fucking honestly, it's, it's a goddamn fake made up game. Uh, I, uh, oh, Jesus Christ. You want to talk about being offended by this? I saw an NBA one where Wilt Chamberlain was in the $3 tier. How does that happen? Well, yeah. How the, the fuck stilt? would that happen? Well, but but no, I think that's just silliness. You know, for heaven's sake, and somebody's got to be in the in the bottom tier, I guess. You know, the put the monkeys in there. The monkeys would love to have been in it. But it's a meaningless tweet. Here's the he, here's the tweet, Jim. WWE on Fox tweeted out, "We're just gonna leave this here. Enjoy," which is funny considering they took it down. We're just going to leave this here until Natalia complains. <laughs> but here are the tiers. $5 tier. Becky Lynch, Bailey, Sasha Banks, Charlotte Flair. $4 tier. Asuka, Io Shirai, Kaylee Ray, and Bianca Belair. Three Kaylee Ray up there in the, in the $4, folks? Apparently so. The $3 mm. tier, Rhea Ripley. Oh, Ni Jesus Christ. Nia Jax, Shayna Baszler. Oh, for heaven. Now, there's an, there's an injustice right there. Everybody who was in the tier with Nia Jax should be like, no, fuck you. Shayna Baszler and Alexa Bliss. The $2 tier, Naomi, Lana, Dakota Kai, and Raquel Gonzalez. And finally, the $1 tier, Liv Morgan. Ruby Riot, Natalia, and Peyton Royce. And upon publication of this Build Your Team for $15 tweet, here were the comments from Natalia. I have struggled for years to figure out exactly what my worth is, but I won't allow anyone to pick that number for me. As hurtful as seeing this is, I want it to be known that if I ever find myself under all of these wonderful women, it's because I'm a pillar and a foundation of what we're doing. Oh, good God. I like Natalia. She's a great fucking wrestler, but they, she's taking this way too seriously. And also, <laughs> if you didn't put a fucking money limit on it in differing amounts, then nobody could play the game because everybody just take the top five fucking girls. So please keep the dollar, because anyone who knows anything knows how priceless I am. Oh. I mean, I feel bad or feelings are hurt, but... This isn't I, the thing I, yes. to have your feelings hurt over. And I'm saying, I don't understand having your feelings hurt about some goofy online fucking... <sighs> this well, is why I, The Undertaker I, I, says I, I, the wrestlers are soft. Yeah, now. But there you go! <laughs> the aura of danger and violence has become my feelings are hurt because you didn't value me properly on an online fantasy game. Well, I, I would pay at least $3 for Natalia. See, now you're building into this, too. You're doing what they're doing. I don't even know if they know what they're doing, so how can I be doing it? If they don't know what they're doing, then how do I know what they're doing to do it, too? Well, look, let's look on the bright side, Natalia. At least you're not wrestling in Joshi Apartment House Wrestling. Boy, that, yeah. See, the mighty can fall even further. Because, the, see, those girls, they only charge, like, seven yen. All right, let's, let's get far away from this. Our next question, Jim, sent via email. What, you Cor don't have a yen for Joshi's? Via email to CourtneyDriveThru at like gmail.com. said one time, I got no reservations about fighting that Indian. This, I got a yen for the Joshi's. This email was sent to CourtneyDriveThru at gmail.com from Donnie in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Jim, I've heard you on numerous occasions refer to Barry Windham as the best worker in the NWA during 1987. So how upsetting was it for you to see Windham come into the WWF in 1996 as mid-card at best with a stupid gimmick like The Stalker? I mean, I'm sure you were happy he found work, but like, what happened to him? He never seemed to go to the next level. Oh, uh, we've talked about it before, um... Barry was not, Barry was a lot like Blackjack. Blackjack would move around a lot. Barry switched back and forth. Every time Dusty wanted to push him, something would happen, he'd go to New York. Or every time he got a spot there, he wouldn't like it, he'd come back. 
And then the early 90s, they were really pushing him and going to use him on top in WCW, but the business was horrible. And, you know, I I could research and do a little, you know, profile of Barry's career, but basically after that first few years of the 90s WCW run, he'd already had some injuries. He gained weight. He lost mental motivation. Um, it, it, People have said about Barry before, also, he he didn't, I don't think he ever wanted to be the guy and have that pressure put on him. He wanted to be a, a top guy and one of the guys, but not the guy. And it seemed like he always shied away from that spot or did things that would keep him from having to fucking fill that spot. And by the mid nineties, when he came in, I mean, you know, there were still flashes, but he was heavier. He had the blackjack jeans where, you know, he was heavier. He was slowed down. He was older. He wasn't mentally motivated. And, and then the gimmicks, the stalker gimmick came from when Vince interviews everybody. He will talk to you about your interests and what you do and what you experiences you've had in your life or whatever. And Barry Windham at the time, he was living in South Georgia out in a fucking swamp and he liked to go hunting and he liked to go gator hunting and all the things the stalker was doing, right? Guns and bows and arrows and shit. So they made that a gimmick out of a guy that had been, what, just a few years beforehand presented as a top talent on their only national competition and instead of utilizing his and i mean blackjack mulligan his father was a wwf tag team champion they had footage and then they tried to do the new blackjacks after that which was even worse poor jack lanza and me had to be involved in that as producers uh which i don't know that jack was thrilled but i could see that it wasn't going to go anywhere um but instead of Saying here's Barry Windham, his father was a great wrestler, but we, we're not going to make him dye his hair and grow a mustache like his father and, you know, send him back to his rookie year when he was Blackjack Mulligan Jr. But his father was a great champion. This guy's been a champion in many organizations and just let him be Barry Windham. First, he was the stalker. Then he was the new Blackjacks. Then he was there when you know, shit stain foisted the NWA invasion off. And since he was synonymous with the nwa they finally let him be himself barry windham but in the midst of a bunch of guys that the only people they could beat was each other in these three minute matches and it just it was just underneath mid-card bullshit and i mean what after that there was a few independent dates did he go back to he went back to wcw for a year or two right was he in the west texas rednecks yeah i think so with kendall and Kurt Hennig and Bobby Duncan Jr. And and then they close and it just, you know, it was that was pretty much it. And it's a shit, but but he definitely was, yes. Uh for the 80s, I didn't say the best worker in the NWA. I said maybe the best worker in the business. Definitely in North America. Just at his size and so smooth and everything was there, and the fucking he could sell like Ricky Morton, but he could come off the top, his his bumps were effortless, his shit looked good, and he had timing, and it just it made every everybody that he got in the ring with made him look better. Beyond any motivation issues, how big was the fact that he had knee issues? That, well, it didn't help, and especially in keeping weight off. And uh, what... You know what? We didn't... We, on the Terry the Gordy shows, story. We were going to talk about the that. The Terry Gordy did. show, on uh, our story, on one of the shows we did here recently, and we branched off, and I just realized that. But <laughs> Me too. <laughs> that's the thing. A guy that, well, I'll tell it to you now here in a second. The guy, A guy that big, when you've got knee issues, it prevents you from being as mobile and also prevents you from, you know, really keeping weight off. In, in Gordy's case, he finally went the opposite direction. I... I tore my right ACL in 86 in the scaffold match at Starcade, and I tore my left one in 87 in Philly in a bad spot in the ring at a house show. And I had to wear the knee braces and et cetera. When Gordy came in in 89, he was wearing uh, the same design knee brace as the second round that I got. And I, I said, well, you got a bad ACL. He said, I got two of them. I said, what? 
what had happened was that he tore in Japan is, you know, he was over there so much and they worked hard and they never took time off. He tore his ACL in one leg by taking an atomic drop. And it just so happened when the guy picked him up and fucking spiked him down, he landed on both feet, but his one leg was locked and he tore the fucking ACL on an atomic drop. Cause that's when he was 300 pounds. And he started, he obviously didn't take any time off and didn't have it fixed and started com- overcompensating. And within a year or so, he told me that he tore the other one, putting too much weight on, overcompensating too much pressure and use on that knee. And he tore it some other kind of way. And he had two blown ACLs. And that's when he dropped weight. If you go back and watch what 89 Gordy versus 91 Gordy or whatever it was, there was a significant weight loss because he wanted to have less weight on his knees because he never did take time off to get them fixed. So every, every one of those matches in Japan or in WCW or the, with the Steiners or whatever that you saw Gordy have after 1989, he was having them on uh, two bad knees. With no ACL in each knee. It may have been even earlier than that, because in 86 in the UWF, when he was the champion, he had more tape. Go look at his knees there. He had so much tape on his knees. It's amazing he was able to Well, it, it, then it may have been earlier. You're right. Cause yeah. some, somewhere in that four or five year time frame, mid 80s to 90, you know, he had he had done all that. But yeah, that the, and... It wasn't like he was diving or taking stupid risks. It was just shit that happens when you took that kind of punishment and those stiff matches night after night for long periods of time. E- even something simple, boom, sooner or later is going to do it. So yeah, w- with Barry, that was a that was a thing also with injuries and just all those bumps at that size and gaining weight and not being motivated and and uh, if he'd have stuck with Dusty the first time he probably would have had the best run of his life for the longest period of his life. But when he left that time, that opened the door for Magnum. And the only thing that opened the door for Barry to come back and take that spot again was Magnum's accident. You know, on that topic, Jim, we actually just got a question about that. This was sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from brothers comics (laughs) in Port St. Lucie, Florida. How and when did the boys find out about Magnum's accident? And when did you find out they were going to turn Nikita babyface? And what was the reaction from you and the other wrestlers? Oh, God. Um, Well, I mean, just not everybody found out about Magnum's accident the same way. Um, Obviously, it was... I'm trying to think of what time of night it would have been. We were coming back from Greenville, South Carolina. It was after the 11 o'clock news in Charlotte would have already aired that the accident took place. It would have probably been midnight to one-ish in the morning because Magnum was almost home and he'd already dropped Dusty off. Uh, So the first chance was the morning newspaper. And so some guys read it in the newspaper, some guys that were particularly close to Magnum and had heard, you know, because the calls that night, I mean, obviously by that point, uh, Crockett knew and, and I don't know, I don't even know the chain of who called who, but Doug Dillinger was still a Charlotte police officer at that point in time. So the Charlotte police had it pretty quick. I'm sure Doug would have been called. I'm sure he would have then called Jimmy Crockett. Um, Crockett would have called Dusty. So guys were hearing overnight, some of those people who knew that, okay, this is a close friend of Magnum. He needs to know without seeing it on the news. They might've got a call, but everybody else, the morning newspaper, the morning TV news, it started and it didn't stop for days. Um, How big a local story was it in the newspapers and on TV? It was the, it was the biggest local story on the, I mean, there wasn't, wasn't anything else going on at that time that, you know, they were talking about whatever the president was doing, but as far as in Charlotte, North Carolina, no, Magnum TA in that car wreck, the pictures of the car, the Porsche that was mangled, and you couldn't believe he got out alive. We're on the front page of the paper. Every uh, TV news sta- or every TV station that had a news broadcast in town covered it on each newscast, morning, evening, night. 
the hospital, they had to ask people not to call the hospital because the switchboard, they couldn't do any business. There were people camping out out front of the stairs, bringing gifts and flowers and signs like it'd be if, you know, out front of Graceland. It was, that's why the, the Flair and whoever went with him, was it Tully Arn? I can't remember who all went with him, but they, to kayfabe, had to wait till actually the middle of the night a couple of days later and sneak up the back stairs to be able to get in to, to see him without anybody knowing what the fuck was going on. But no, it, it was days that, you know, the, the updates and, and, you know, what's the prognosis and blah, blah, blah. Before the wrestling show took over and started giving steady updates, it was in the newspaper, on the news, radio, whatever. How did you find out? I found out, I, I, as far as I remember, the next day of fucking shit was, did I see the news or did one of the boys call me and tell me, turn the news on? It was, I, it would have been a Tuesday, so we were going to go to television. So we would have been close in Charlotte. Anyway, of uh, the other part of the question was when did we find out about I should go get the Midnight Express book, but I won't because uh, for the purposes of this conversation, it was in Charlotte and we had a TV taping scheduled. And I don't think, I, once again, I'm sure, yes, Jimmy Crockett knew, Ric Flair knew, Dusty knew what he was going to do. He told Nikita and everybody that was in the JJ, because he was Dusty's assistant booker, a lot of the guys found out that it was going to be Nikita when he walked out on television, because that's the way things worked in those days. And as soon as we heard the people, regardless of what, see, that's the thing. If we'd heard about it a week ahead of time, or if if they'd called a meeting and said, hey, what do you guys all think about this? We're going to turn Nikita and put him in the spot uh, as Dusty's friend. Well, some people would have shit on it and some people would have liked it or whatever. But when you heard the fucking roar, the way that they, they built it up and introduced it when Nikita walked out in front of those people, then you knew, okay, that's exactly what he should have done because it was fucking momentous. And everybody, I mean, down deep, you know, they made they made real life a story. And I can't remember the promos word for word and how that Dusty introduced it. But the point is, everybody in that building knew that Magnum, the other half of America's team, Dusty's best friend, was fucked up and may never wrestle again. And what's going to happen? And when they saw Nikita come out and that now the superpowers... Dusty was political even then. He could walk that line, baby, walking the edge of the lightning bolt. Um, they just they roared. Well, you can tell on tape. Those crowds in the Carolinas in those days would max out the audio meters. So a lot of times they were so loud, all you got was static. There's really cool footage from the raw George Michael sports machine stuff at Crockett Cup 87, where they have the entire Magnum TA coming down to ringside before the main event at Crockett Cup, which I think was Dusty and Nikita versus Tully and Luger. Yeah. And it, it is pretty cool to just hear that reaction for T.A. In Baltimore, which, you know, could be a hard city for baby faces at times, but it is a really cool bit of raw footage there to hear the reaction. Oh, and at the 88 Cup, they had him walk to the ring in Greensboro and... I got to take a bump for him. He shoved me down. I can't even remember what the circumstances were. I'd have to go back and look at the fucking notes. But um, just him in Greensboro, especially, that was that still gives me goosebumps. Well, Jim, a few more questions before we wrap things up. Our next one sent to corny drive through at gmail dot com from Rob in Vegas. I was wondering. Why Hollywood John Tatum never went to the NWA or WWF during his career? Well, how can I be polite? Um, there's a lot of fucking garage bands that didn't get signed by Epic Records either. I, John Tatum, to me, and I just saw him, as a matter of fact, at the last Charlotte Wrestling reunion that we went to, what, a couple of years ago now. And I swear to God, I I didn't recognize him at first because he doesn't have the long blonde hair anymore. But he was the real life of the party there. He was happy to be there. Um, 
It was, he was, it, he wanted to be Michael Hayes. As a matter of fact, when I first met John Tatum was in 1983 in Georgia, he wasn't even working for Ole or for the ragtag band that, uh, that Jerry Jarrett had sent down for Dundee to book of all of us. He was working some independence in South Carolina, but he was living at the Falcons rest with some of the boys. And the first time I ran into him, it was one o'clock in the morning. I was taking my garbage out to the dumpster after we came in from a town and he was standing there pissing in the swimming pool. And I'm like, what the fuck? And he was Franklin Hayes. Because he was it, even then, even back then, guys wanted to get into business and be like their hero. And Michael Hayes had been established for about five years, four or five years at that point, the Freebirds, and he wanted to be Michael Hayes. Weren't they friends? Weren't they friends? They were friends. Well, yeah, they, yeah. And they were friends, and he's in Georgia. So, you know, he's, it's you know, it's like that fucking lunatic Ernest T. Bass that wanted to be Buddy Landell's brother in Knoxville. Anyway, so I actually still have a VHS tape somewhere of the goddamn outlaw local cable access South Carolina show that he was working on at that time. But anyway, um, he and Missy got friendly and basically he got booked in mid South for that run where, and then art imitated life and Missy left John Tatum for Eddie Gilbert. Well, they went to Dallas first. Well, they went to Dallas and then to Louisiana, but that was really the only Run, he got, did, am I missing something about John Tatum's in-ring or the the persona that he projected and the promos he did were sort of more like a whiny crybaby Michael Hayes? And it, and the, I don't know if his work was there. What am I missing? Um, that's pretty much why he didn't go anywhere. He was pretty good. Him and Jack Victory were a good tag team. Obviously, it was hard to get past the real life and angle of Missy Hyatt leaving him for Eddie Gilbert. I believe he was in a car accident shortly after that, which put him on the sidelines for a period of time. And then he was just one of those guys that for years, the end of world class, USWA, global, every just independent. Just stayed in Texas. Just stayed in Dallas. You would see him on all those shows in Dallas. I want to say, I mean, I could be wrong. Didn't his, he was with Tessa, right? And then she left him also for Bill Dundee. Oh, God, I think you may be right. And then he became like a golfer or something. But he was just one of those guys like Action Jackson that you'd always see on those shows in Dallas for years. And he never really went anywhere. But he was pretty good in his, I was going to say in his prime, but like at his peak, at John Tatum's peak, it is, he was pretty that's, good. That's a, that's a, a fairly moderate-sized peak, though. But he certainly was overshadowed by Missy. Like in world class, yeah. she was the star. I mean, she was incredible. Yeah. Not just in terms of looks. I mean, she was gorgeous, but Missy was one of the best valets in wrestling history. Oh, she got so much fucking heat. Because she was just the, the perfect ditzy, blonde, you know, rich girl, cuntish, you know, uh, uh, person who was supposed to be the the trophy for the wrestler that he had on his arm, but in actuality was the high maintenance heat magnet of the whole thing and made their lives living hells in storyline. I'm talking about. I think Missy may be one of the people on the list of most underutilized in wrestling history. She was fantastic as a valet and world class, had a lot of heat. Same thing in mid South. Goes with Eddie to Memphis in eighty eight. She was great there. Yeah. And then from that point forward, she was never used that way again. Well, WCW Tammied her because the same thing. Tammy Sitch was a tremendous heat-getting personality manager that had more heat than her talent in Smoky Mountain Wrestling because that was wrestling and she was presented as a wrestling personality and, and she got physically attacked. I've told a story about when that Fucking 250 pound corn fed farm woman in Barberville, Kentucky, grabbed her by the hair and pulled her all the way across the Knox Central High School gym. Brian Lee, Candido, none of the boys wanted to hit the fucking woman, even though the woman was bigger than they were. But she had heat. But then she goes to the WWF and now it's entertainment. And they just liked her because she was a pretty girl. And they presented her as a pretty girl and didn't get heat on her. With Missy, 
That happened years earlier. They, it, it, she shows up in WCW under the in the TBS administration, and they want to make her an announcer or give her an interview segment or have her on the calendar. I mean, she was a babyface manager for the yeah. Steiner brothers. Yes, and, but a babyface with the Steiner, like they needed or wanted a manager. And wasn't it, didn't she get, she got some money out of them for that fucking picture. Oh yeah, she sued them and, because they, yes, there was a wardrobe malfunction, I guess we'll call it, when she was managing the Nasty Boys. No, there, there wasn't a wardrobe malfunction. The Steiner brothers, one of the Steiners carried her back. Oh, I'm thinking of a different picture. Okay. I thought it was the Steiners carrying her. Was it the Nasties? The one I'm thinking of that got her to sue them in 1994 for, I think, sexual harassment was one of her breasts was exposed when she managed the Nasty Boys. Oh, no. There was one where they, one of the Steiners was carrying her like you carry the damsel in distress back from the ring, but she didn't have any panties on. And they had her folded up like a jackknife, and somebody took a picture that illustrated she didn't have any panties on, and they put it up, they tacked it up on the wall in the edit suite. Um, at least of what I... But nevertheless... Uh, yeah, as a baby face, as an announcer, no, that was totally wrong. She could have, she could have had more heat than I did as a manager if they'd have done it right, but they were looking at, at entertainment and pretty girls and, you know, that was the same thing that they did with, in the WWF with Tammy several years later. They ruined what made them great because they were also attractive. In 89... So Eddie comes back at the beginning of the year, or the end of the previous year, and eventually he's on the booking committee. Missy becomes the first lady of WCW, or the first lady of the NWA, managing the Steiner brothers, very often just holding their dog. But even as a babyface, she kind of did some cool stuff, like when Muda blew the mist in her face, when they had the Muda-Eddie Gilbert feud that summer. And then, even though she wasn't used to her capabilities... As the babyface manager, once Eddie leaves the booking committee, she still manages the Steiners for a time, but that's when they start introducing Nancy as Robin Green and then yep. Woman, and then Missy's just gone for a while. How much heat was there between the Eddie and Missy camp and the Kevin and Nancy camp? Well, that it I don't want to speak for anybody personally. Um, but that was not really the fucking crux of the matter the crux of the matter was the flair got mad at eddie and booted him off the booking committee missy was not only signed to a contract but in a spot uh but i don't think that flair was probably a fan of missy's probably just because she was with eddie whereas kevin who had been on the booking committee before rick demanded the book was Rick's trusted lieutenant and really the only, well, I won't say the only guy he could really trust and, and really get constant feedback from, because I was on it. He could trust me, but Kevin was his right-hand guy, and I was the junior partner in this firm. And Kevin pitches the idea, obviously, for Nancy, and I think it was probably just the way it worked out that Missy was in it because the Steiners had to be in it. Because the whole idea was a, a fucking going to be a, a way to entrap Scott Steiner. Uh, so Rick Steiner. I'm sure, or Rick Steiner, rather. Um, so I'm sure that Eddie and Missy, neither one were happy about the whole situation, but I don't think that Kevin nor Nancy had anything against Kevin always spoke well of Eddie. Um, and why would Nancy be mad at Missy? Because she's coming in, getting the good spot, and she knows Missy's on the way out because Flair don't like Eddie, and they know that's going to be issues. That's why I never... I, I'm sorry, but in most cases, when you have a a guy and a girl on the roster who are romantic with each other, unless they're, unless they're the only female... Um, you got problems in all kinds of directions. If they break up, you've got a problem. If there's another female and, and, and she's with another guy, then you've got all kinds of problems. I always preferred for the boys to fuck the rats and leave the girls in the business alone. Now it's completely reversed the opposite way. They don't touch the rats because there are none. Fuck around with all the girls on the roster and have ill feelings all around inside the locker room. I don't get it. But anyway, 
there may have been some heat with Missy and Eddie. There probably wasn't any heat with Kevin and Nancy. And I'll say this too. Paul Heyman had a reputation in the 90s among some as a booking genius. The fact that he didn't find anything better to do with Missy when she went to ECW has always astounded me because she was so talented. Again, one of the most underutilized talents in the history of wrestling, Missy Hyatt. But Jim, what did she do? What did she do in WC or in ECW? I can't even remember. I think she debuted at ringside. She was just sitting in a front row seat making out with Stevie Richards. <laughs> and then they put her with the Sandman, replacing Nancy, who had been with the Sandman. And that was it. Like, you know, very few promos on TV. If anything, it would just be in the montage of things at the end of the show. But she was the walking riot, Missy Hyatt. There's so much that could have been done with her. I'm wondering if Missy was even into it at that point, or if she even gave a shit. I don't know, but, you know, Jim, I think Missy probably would have gotten even more money had a Ted Turner in WCW when she sued them if she had the right lawyer on her side. Good representation is what you're saying, young man. You need good representation in order to maximize your ability to be compensated when you've been damaged in some way, whether your career has been damaged or your personality has been damaged or you've been slandered or you've been harmed by greedy people, major corporations, rotten, underhanded wrestling bookers. Only one man can take you to the promised land of the pay window in the United States court system. Only one man fights for the little guys and triumphs for them on a regular basis. Only one man. Call Stephen P. News. If you need to see an outlaw mud show or two. To the rest. Folks, you know the phone number, 888-692-8084. You know the email address, newlawoffice.com. You know the man himself who was just on the experience this past week telling us how he's helping not only citizens in West Virginia, but folks across the country and people in the wrestling industry that have been put upon by a serial sewer. You know, I knew some way I would be able to compare him to a sewer one of these days. Anyway, <laughs> the man we're talking about is Stephen P. New. The sewer we were talking about is Dick Boy. And Stephen P. New is helping people on both sides of the wrestling industry, the fans in the seats and the folks in the ring, and he can help you too. Brian, how many cases now have we been talking about the, the cancer from Roundup, the cancer from talcum powder, the uh, uh, abused senior citizens in the nursing home. And now the incredible case he's got were 55 uh, veterans of service here in the United States were assaulted in an indecent manner by one of the doctors at the Veterans Administration. Stephen P. New is chasing these people down, making them squeal, sh turning them upside down and shaking them for change. And he could do the same thing for you with your legal entanglements. We cannot recommend anyone more highly than the Baron of the Barristers, the consigliere of the cult of court at himself, Stephen P. New. All right, Jim, one final question, and then we'll play a song or two. This is another one that's a popular topic that several people have sent in, so I will ask you. Sent to corny drive through at gmail.com. This one is from Greg. Dave Meltzer recently tweeted the following. Riddle me this. How many Booker of the Year winners in the last 28 years didn't grow up reading my writing and learning from it? Oh, God. Answer is two. Oh, good God. Answer is two, and one couldn't have because he's much older than I am. Looking at the best Booker winners of the last 28 years, my assumption would be that the two he is referring to are Vince McMahon and Triple H. Since Jim Cornette won Best Booker numerous times in that period, that would mean Dave is inferring that what? Jim learned from reading Dave. Wait. Then someone asked Dave, are you seriously trying to insinuate 
that you have had an influence on the Bookers of the Year's booking ability, you are delusional. Dave responded, You honestly think people spending an hour plus a week reading something didn't pick up any of the lessons? Dave went on to say, He's a college professor now, is what you're saying. It would be impossible not to, given in my life of the three people I've spent the most time talking booking with, two of the three are multi-time winners, the third is Mike Tanay, who was never a singular booker, but was on committees at different times. Once again, Greg says, My assumption is Jim is one of the people he is referencing in this, since Dave used to have a good relationship with Jim. Can Jim clarify if he learned booking lessons from reading Dave's writing and if Dave was in part responsible for Jim's booking ability? Oh, good God. But it take me out of it for a second. What just why would you say why would you come out and say something like that to begin with? That all the all but two of the Booker of the Year winners of the last 30 years learned booking by reading my writing. Why would you? I, didn't we talk about it? Was it on the experience just this last week where a lot of people have to come up and make themselves more important than they really are, either verbally or try to give that impression or whatever, just for to fill some need? They're so and so's cousin. They're related to so and so. They used to work with so and so. My neighbor was the original mass superstar, and now Dave's doing it. Uh, and no, and it's it's not even an insult. I've learned a lot uh, from Dave's writing when it comes to the obituary pieces that he has done, which he puts a lot of research in. And I learn about the careers of some of these guys, especially that were lost to the mists of time and, and, and uh, you get a new look at them. The historical pieces are wonderful. But I'd never heard of Dave Meltzer or read anything he wrote until I'd been in the business for fucking three years. 1985. Jimmy Garvin comes in the goddamn Crockett's uh, office for promos on a Wednesday, and he said, hey, have you seen the scandal sheet? I said, what? He showed me an observer. He had gotten a hold of one of the... It had just started like a year before, if that. One of the early episodes of episodes, issues of The Observer. And I, look, I said, Jesus Christ, it was the first time that I had seen somebody writing down finishes and bookers and et cetera in a, a published publication, only letters amongst, you know, close fans and people in the business. And I quickly started reading it and saw that it it was a way to keep up with who was where and what territory and what was going on. But I pretty much was already in the business for several years at that point, not to mention my six years previous to getting in the business at 82 as a photographer and et cetera. So my thoughts on things were kind of shaped before I read Dave's magic words. But who else does that take in? In the last, what do you say, 28 years? You know why I said 28 years? Go back and look and see who won it in 1993, too. Uh, you won it in 1993. I have the list right here. Yeah. So he was trying to get out of me by saying, lad, instead of saying in the last 30 years, the last 28 years. But didn't I win it in 2000-something, too? Uh, here are the winners in order from 86 on. All right. 86, Dusty Rhodes. 87, Vince McMahon. 88, Eddie Gilbert. 89, 90, and 91, Giant Baba. 92, Ricky Choshu. 93, Jim Cornette. 94, 95, 96, 97, Paul Heyman. 98, 99, and 2000, Vince McMahon. 2001, Jim Cornette. 2002, Paul Heyman. 2003, Jim Cornette. 2004, 2005, 6, and 7, Gabe Sapolsky. 2008, 9, and 10, Joe Silva of the UFC. 2011, 12, 13, and 14, Ghetto and Jado. 2015, Triple H and Ryan Ward. Wait a minute, I wonder how, how Ghetto and Jado's grip on English was when they were growing up reading 
nevertheless. I don't know. I don't know how well they uh, they read English. I'm not going to comment, but I'm um, sure as adults they do. But he's t- said these guys grew up and uh, shaped their wrestling booking by reading me. So, all right, go ahead. 2016, 17, 18, and 19 ghetto and 2020 hasn't been announced yet but based on the reaction from the people who vote on things i'm gonna guess they're gonna give it to tony khan so that you know it. well now that i've heard that list i'm kind of not as fucking flattered to be on it as i used to be when i was up with dusty Rhodes, vince mcmahon jim Cornette, fucking giant bob i'm like okay but <laughs> it's gone to fucking yeah bless him gabe sapolsky and ghetto and Ryan fucking who? Ryan who? Ryan Ward and Triple H, 2015 for NXT. I assume NXT. I'm sure one of those people was the paper carrier and the other one was telling him what to do. It, I, I don't know what to say about that. No, my, I didn't learn any booking. I've learned plenty of history from the historical pieces on different personalities that Dave and his staff have researched. And that's wonderful. And that's the best part of his writing, but I didn't figure out booking from Dave Meltzer. And I won it recent, more recently than 28 years ago. But boy, with Heyman, with those those runs of the table on several year stretches, goddamn, now I know how he felt when I won the manager of the year 13 years in a row and shut him out. <laughs> yeah, damn, that's, that's, that's cold. Well, Sherry won it one of those years. That's the year I took off. 91. Yeah. And set up Smoky Mountain Wrestling. I had to give it to somebody else. I said, fuck it. I'm not working this year. Somebody else can win it. All right. Well, on that note, another drive through in the books. (laughs) Jim, let's get a song or two. Or in the booking. Or in the booking, as they say. Or in the booking. Well, I mean, just to go back to this for one second, because there has been a level of condescending comments in Dave's tweets at times. But do you think in any way maybe it's gone to his head a little bit, the fact that like a Tony Khan is up and running with a big budget, openly talking about how influential the Observer was to him? I mean, the fact that he's just coming out and saying this now, that, you know, these guys all learned from reading me. I guess maybe he just, you know, at this point he wants the the people in the business rather than the people just reading him but the people in the business to say he's been a great mind all along i never said he was an idiot until he started saying stupid shit um and he still got a lot of good points but i i don't i don't recognize this this dave at least i stay consistent i'm always an asshole he was nice and normal and then suddenly fucking flipped out and became an anal wrestling rain man And it's just, he's not fun anymore. Well, let's get to a song or two. This one. That would be a good song title. Anal Wrestling Rain Man. Yeah, I don't know about that. And with that, the drive-thru is closed. All right. Pretty good that time. Of course, remember you can hear the Jim Cornette experience when it debuts this Saturday. Wherever you find your favorite podcasts, we'll be back next Tuesday here on the drive-thru. Get access to classic episodes of the drive through and the experience by becoming a patron. Patreon.com slash Cornet. For only $5 a month, you get access to the archives from the beginning in 2013. Right now, we are uploading episodes from the summer of 2016. Get access to all these classic shows uncut by becoming a patron. Patreon.com slash Cornet. The official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. It'll come right up. Subscribe today. Closing in on 200,000 subscribers. Check out full episodes, clips of episodes, and omnibus collections, all with the amazing and exclusive Travis Heckle artwork, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. You can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Cornet's Collectibles at jimcornet.com. Stay tuned. Stand back and stand by, ladies and gentlemen. Hey! It'll be back in March with the action figures once again, plus so much more, the official Jim Cornet 
Or actually, no, forget that. It's just Cornette's Collectibles at Jim yeah, Cornette. JimCornette.com. That's right. The drive through is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New, 888 692 8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until Friday on the experience, excuse me, until Saturday on the experience, I got to get used <laughs> to this. And Tuesday, right back here on the drive through for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally ho!